3 o'clock p.m. It is uh, July 14th, and we are going to go into a, about a half an hour works, uh, executive session. So Chris is going to um, take us off Zoom for the time being, and if everybody could go over to the go-to meeting if you have it. Shannon should have just sent it. Okay, but Chris, first, so we, we should leave this meeting? No, Chris is going to pause us, right? Or do we leave this? No, you got to do the motion. First, I'm going to make the move. I move that the town council go into executive session pursuant to paragraph 4B of section 246402 CRS relating to conferences with the town's telecommunications attorney, Ken Fellman, for purposes of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions. Second. All right. I don't want this open. A uh, motion has been made for the town council to go into an executive session pursuant to paragraph 4B of section 246402 CRS relating to conferences with the town's telecommunication attorney, Ken Fellman, for purposes of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions. Subject of the executive session involves a confidential discussion with the town's telecommunication attorney, Ken Fellman, concerning legal issues with the regulation of small cells in the town. Roll call, please. Mr. Gallagher? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Yellow? Yes. Ms. Owens? Yes. Mr. Poon? Yes. Mr. Carlton? Yes. Mayor Mamula? Yes. Okay, so right. anybody in the audience, we're going to be gone for about a half an hour, so take a break, and then uh, come back and join us. We're gonna get some advice on small cells that are driving us crazy. Okay, so what? What do we just? I just shrink our screen and go on to uh, go to meeting. Was or, or do we just leave this meeting? Jeffrey, if you can, you're just gonna have to get your camera on on go to and not on Zoom. So if it's easier for you to just shut the Zoom meeting and come back to it later, re log in later, you might want to do that. Is there a go to meeting right here in my my uh, screen, or do I? Do I email I emailed no, it I just, to you. Oh yeah, I'll just shrink it down. We'll see okay. what happens. We'll okay. See what happens. Okay. I'm gonna leave meeting. You sh he should have maybe muted himself before. <laughs> Ken Feldman. I am here. Hi, Ken. Hello there. Hi, Julia. Thirteenth at three forty-six p.m. We just came out of an executive session, and we move into uh, planning commission decisions for July seventh. Are there any questions? There are four approvals. Nope. Yep. Okay. The we won't need anybody later this evening then for uh, for planning commission call-ups, unfortunately. Uh, legislative review. We start with St. John's local landmarking. This is second reading. Tim. This ordinance, uh, if adopted tonight, will landmark the uh, church property. You will recall that this was required under the terms of the planning, recent planning approval and development agreement. Um, the planning commission has reviewed the property and their request for landmarking finds it to be a good application and both the staff and the planning commission have recommended to the council that the ordinance be adopted on second reading. There are no changes to the ordinance from the version approved on first reading. Thank you, Tim. Any questions for Tim on this? Okay. Uh, how are those, uh, how, how are those uh, Methodists? Are they Methodist? What is this? Is this the, 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 what church is this? This is uh, Episcopalian. It's Episcopal. Yeah, are they okay to work with? So far, so good. All right. Oh, Jeffrey. Catholics can be heavy-handed, but Episcopals, are, they're pretty mellow. Excuse me? 
Jeffrey. What? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Me at his house controlling him, Aaron. Uh, we have 2020 budget appropriations for tier one budget reductions. This is a resolution. Brian? Good afternoon. What this resolution will achieve is memorialize the budget cuts we discussed when the COVID impacts were first being felt here in Breckenridge. Uh, Council will recall in late uh, March, we started looking at uh, budget reduction amounts and program reductions, as well of, as a lot of CIP stuff uh, in order to trim our expenses and try to mitigate uh, the financial impacts as much as we could. So what we need to do is approve this resolution so we can actually start putting those in our, our financial reporting system and, and make them official. And uh, that will help us going forward with our analysis and, and other things. Thanks, Brian. Uh, questions? Everybody good with this? Ready to move to tier two? Not quite yet. All right. Wait, let's hope not, huh? Uh, resolution to approve an amendment to the IGA with the school district for the McCain property. Also a resolution. Rick or Tim? I'll do it. Uh, Mayor and Council, you may recall in June of 2019, we entered into an intergovernmental agreement with the school district to transfer a property that was owned by the town to the school district out on the McCain parcel. A part of that IGA had some conditions that had to be met with that property uh, by the time of December 31st, 2023, and that included raising it out of the flood zone and also the location of some utilities in the roadway that would run adjacent to the property. Uh, you know, due to some of the challenges with COVID, I reached out to the school district and I said, we'd really like to push those uh, deadlines out an additional three years to 2026 to give us time to spread the cost of doing that work over a longer period of time, especially if you don't have any immediate plans to do anything on that property. And uh, yeah, they were okay with doing it. And so um, if you're okay with this, that'll allow us to sign the amended IGA. Any questions for Rick? I just wondered how you chose the till 2026, that timeline. Kelly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Nice, nice job, Rick. That was uh, <laughs> that was a good move. Save us some money. Do we? Yeah, I just thought it was, I didn't want to push it too far, but I thought it was reasonable to give us some more time. Yeah. yeah. Do we know what their plan is or when their plans will start? They're usually pretty hush hush on what plans they have because it tends to kind of send a ripple effect throughout the district of, you know, if they ever had any plans to close a school or add on to a school or whatever. And so uh, the short answer is no, we do not have any idea what they would do with that property. Other questions? Okay, we will uh, see this again this evening. Uh, manager's report, pro uh, public projects update, Rick, or Shan Shannon, <laughs> or Shannon, Shannon, Shannon. Jeez. What do you got, Shannon? I don't have anything to add to the memo, but I can take questions if anyone has questions on any of the projects. Hey, what do you? What is the actual timeline for what Excel is? Slowly, slowly working on on Wellington. Slowly. For, for the paving. Yeah, I mean, yes, I guess. It's all that's left. Well, I was hoping they were going to finish it last week. Um, so that was the timeline that we expected. They haven't finished paving it. I haven't driven up there this week yet. <laughs> so what we were told, what we were told yesterday by Mark Johnson is that they were 30 days out. They're, we're requiring them to pave that whole uh, kind of westbound lane. Um, and they were 30 days out from being able to do that. And we said, you can't have that uh, current condition. So they did, they filled in that with kind of a temporary patch in that cut area, which is what they did in the last three days. And uh, that's just to hold it over until about a month from now, I guess. And then they'll come and mill and overlay the whole lane, like Rick was saying. So the temporary should be completed. It is. Okay. 
and then like Rick said, four to six weeks on the whole overlay. Okay. Other questions for Shannon on uh, public projects, anyone? Parks look good. The parks picture. Park. Yeah, I saw some kids playing in it the other day. Are they distanced? Or yeah, they, they were distancing from me. Good. The river park is awesome. Yeah, pretty cool. Okay, uh, PT ridership numbers. PT ridership numbers. And then, uh, and then the Watson uh, roundabout. What's a roundabout? I mean, yeah, the Watson roundabout's a pretty big deal, <laughs> but I'm also sure it's not any surprise to anybody because we've been talking about it. But this is the this is kind of the engineering design that we've received. Um, you may recall that part of our lease agreement with uh, with Bell Resorts uh, stated in there that we knew that we would uh, have to have uh, some of their property in that wetlands area. And, you know, what we thought, so we're actually amending that lease agreement because there's no long, it's not really a, a an easement that they're going to need anymore, but CDOT is going to require, is uh, is it a fee simple, Tim, or something, right? Uh, it's, it's a real yes. project. Huh? It's fee, yeah, it's fee simple. Yeah. Ownership of the land, not an easement. Yeah, which I, it's not going to be a problem. I mean, we've already communicated with Vail Resorts, and they're aware of that condition uh, from CDOT, uh, because we did push... Shannon, it looks like we pushed that design to the west a little bit, right? So we'd have less impact on the gondola lots. Yeah, it's justified to the west, but that's always been the intent to minimize impact to both north and south. And the construction timing on this is 2022, the summer after we open the yes. park structure. Have we thought about or talked at all about what's going to go in the middle? Bailey. <laughs> no. We, we're going around the route of simple landscaping that doesn't take a lot of me. Yeah, I agree. If we yeah. want to do something different, we can discuss it. Small cell tower, 75 feet high. <laughs> <laughs> and now that we know, we could. Uh, we can have some conceal elements on it too. Right. Mm -hmm. Cantana. Uh, any other questions on uh, the Watson roundabout? Everybody good with this design? I mean, it's pretty much what we have expected. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Shannon, how tight is your timeline on this? You know, you you've got it in here that laid it out. Is is there much wiggle room in there? For which part of it? I mean, we have a nice appropriate timeline going to <laughs> CDOT environmental and right of way. If we wanted to make some design changes, we do have time for that. The biggest piece is making sure we don't go larger to require more right of way dedication once we get through that piece with CDOT. Shannon, Shannon, has, has a ski resort seen this map? They have, but I could send it to them again. If you think it'd be relevant, Tim, to the lease agreement, I wouldn't hurt because the the amendment, as you know, requires him to give or convey the property. Mm -hmm. um, and I I keep getting questions from Vale's attorney about the legal description and all that. So if you wouldn't mind sending it to Skier, that'd be helpful. Sure, we can. And I'll caveat that that the right of way extents will be slightly bigger than the line work shown. Yes. Got it. Other questions? Okay, how about uh, parking structure? There's a pretty lengthy uh, photo portfolio uh, about the dig, the, the big dig. It's way, way deeper than I thought it was going to be. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know we what? Are, yeah. I, I just wanted to add also, just so you're aware that we are amending. Um, is that lease agreement amendment will come back in front of the council, Tim? For the roundabout, Rick? Yes. 
Well, yeah. so there, when we did the whole big lease agreement with Vail Resorts for the parking structure, there's a couple, a couple of cleanup things that need to occur in there, and we're amending it. And one of the, one of the things we just talked about, which was the transfer, actual transfer of ownership on the property for the roundabout. And another thing um, that you'll see in there is that there was, there was a section in the lease agreement that said that if we didn't feel like we would make the deadline of November 21st for um, completion of the parking structure that at a point identified, uh, we would shift our efforts uh, from, um, you know, working on the parking structure to making sure that we had a, the surface uh, spots ready to be occupied by skiers because they didn't want to lose they didn't want to lose all the parking two winners in a row uh, so we you know we agreed that by a date in may of 21 um, we will be able to say come together and say um, you know and pick basically by that date we will come together and say uh, pick a date, agreed upon date that we will know whether we're going to shift our efforts or not. Um, we'll we'll have a very good idea by May of 21 if we're on schedule and and feel like we're going to meet our deadline. Um, I think you know the real the real pieces for us are going to be the concrete delivery, the precast that starts happening uh, later late fall, um, and you know those are the those are the things that if we're going to have hiccups or something that make us nervous, but we feel very, Shannon feels very comfortable with this May date uh, that we're putting into the agreement. So. All right. Other questions on the parking structure? And how about uh, any questions on ridership, transit ridership? Yeah. Um, are we meeting capacity? How is that going as far as, are we meeting the 10 riders per bus or? What well, we expanded the to 25. Okay. Uh, that happened a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't think for the most part that we're actually hitting capacity yet. Uh, James, can are you aware if we're actually hitting capacity on any of our buses? No, I don't know that that has not been an issue. As Rick has indicated, we are we did increase the ridership to 25 per bus, and um, on very few occasions we do have ghost bus available on on the both the gray route and the brown route. And so far, we've only had to run that on a few occasions. Great. So no no issues on the 25 to answer the question. James, any issues on uh, mass compliance? We have run into a few instances, Jeffrey, um, and quite honestly, they've been kind of isolated to, to one hand of incidences. But um, oh, okay. we, we, just like you know, some of the discussion on Main Street, it's uh, there are people that don't like to wear them. So. Are the are the bus? Do the bus? Do you feel like the bus drivers need more support, or are they, do they feel comfortable? enforcing the masks? I think they're comfortable for the most part, Aaron. Um, we have implemented a lot of protocols and safety for them. I mean, I think as with all of us, I think there still tends to be times where they feel like, you know, the exposure mm -hmm. is greater than or exists, certainly. But um, for the most part, our drivers do feel safe. We've, we've had, uh, um, yeah, for the most part, I think we're, we're good. Thank you. Good. Other questions for James while he's here? All right. I've ridden the bus a bunch of times at night, James. It's, it seems fine. I mean, ridership is super low. There's usually only one or two people on the bus with me, but you know, the drivers are doing a great job and the barricades are good. And you know, it's, it's hard to talk to the bus driver through the plexiglass, but they're making it work, so thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, how about uh, child care committee notes for 617 and uh, 71? 
Any questions? I had a question. Um, it's not going to be a surprise. It's the I'm trying to think of what the find the original comment. What are it says the days are still slightly shorter um, to accommodate extra cleaning and requirements. What what does that mean? It mostly means that they're um, like usually they would open at either seven or seven thirty depending on the facility and then close at 5.30 or 6. And um, I think all the facilities are opening a half an hour later and closing a half hour earlier. Okay. So like and really it has to do with cleaning, but it also has to do with that you can't have a bunch of teachers show up at the same time as the kids. Like everyone has to be in their classrooms. So the teachers have to get there at 7.30 open the classrooms, make sure everything's repaired, make sure it's sanitized, open up all the windows, and then the kids can start arriving at eight. And so, um, and you know, then they, you drop off the kids one at a time. So it's, it's as much to give the teachers time to um, clean and things like that as it is to make sure that people aren't mingling and that there's the least amount of people in the entryway at the time at one time. And you know, like right now it's really easy because everything's outside and they have the temp check table outside. And so you can, you don't, you're not in an area, but as the winter comes up, um, it is gonna require that people like stand in the foyer to get their temps checked. Cause those thermometers just don't, you know, they don't work in extreme conditions. So like <laughs> morning in Breckenridge in the summer, that kind of extreme. So, um, Huh. they will have to be inside. So I think, you know, as much um, to allow the teachers to be in the classrooms as also to figure out how to work this over the next year, year and a half, to make sure that it works in, into the winter as well. So about eight, eight to five is pretty good. That's eight to five, yeah. So it's really, I think there are, I don't think there are any facilities who are providing less than um, one hour less than their normal care half hour in the morning, half hour in the afternoon. Okay, great. Thank and you. And that also has to do with just budgeting. You know, we can't, nobody can afford to pay the teachers more than, you know, for 11 hours. Not only that, but they're already working their 40 hours and we, nobody has extra teachers on hand. So it's just, it's so complicated if you start adding hours just for cleaning and, and arrival. Yeah, I think, I think an hour is reasonable. I think that's, that's great and I'm glad. I'm really glad that the facilities are up and running full speed or close. Yeah, to it's awesome and they're working super hard, but it's still hard for the parents. You know, if you're supposed to be at work at eight o'clock, it is a burden to be able to drop your kid off. So there are just kinks that are going to have to be worked out and some that won't get worked out because we're in a pandemic. So it's hard for everyone. For sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay. I do have another question about um, the parent survey about um the a quarantine requirement do you know when we'll hear back about that the uh, about yeah. when we'll travel yeah i think basically um that was a discussion just that was brought up because we do have a lot of families and teachers that travel um and so you know there was just sort of a conversation around um do we have a liability are we responsible for telling anybody that we know people are traveling and um, we decided uh, on the little red board and I think that Timberline and Carriage House probably um, fell about in the same area which was just that without a travel restriction at the state level we really weren't comfortable with making that um, determination on like okay well where do you notify people that they're you know if they're traveling to Texas you would notify them but if they travel to Wisconsin you don't but then Wisconsin blows up and you know, so just, just there were way too many personal calls. And also um, there have been a lot of, there has been, I shouldn't say a lot, there has been some confrontation with, um, you know, teachers and administration at the front. And we just don't want to open up to any more of that. So unless there was like a statewide restriction, I don't think there's much of an appetite for moving further with that discussion. Okay, thank you. Hey. Kelly, please give uh, the teachers you come into contact with our, uh, our kudos and well wishes. I would not want to do that for a living right now. 
<laughs> anytime, Jeffrey. But or anytime. But yeah, that <laughs> we we need to have those things open, and and they're they're really serving our community. And I tell them we appreciate their effort. Or I do. Thanks. I I definitely will, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, they're definitely frontline employees. I mean, you know, kids under two don't have to wear masks, and they are just spreading their germs everywhere. So the teachers, you know, have the mask on and everything, and as we've learned they're protecting our kids but our kids aren't protecting them you know so it it definitely is a um a position that deserves the kudos thanks jeffrey and I'll, i will tell them that um and dick also asked me um just yesterday whether the number of applicants for tuition assistance was pretty much on track i talked to corey about that and she did think that we were a little bit light um like maybe 10 less applications than we would normally have and I said, oh, okay, so is this like a, you know, outreach situation? Usually Corey or in the past Jen would have gone into the, um, into the facilities and made sure that people knew about the program. But she thinks it actually has more to do with people that aren't back to work yet. So whether that's because they're off because they're a teacher and their other kids are home, that could be it. Or it could just be that they have limited hours and between the family, they can make it work and not, um, you know, not have that additional expense right now. But so what they'll do is they'll close the application period at the normal time. But then if you have a family change, you can apply through the year. So that's what those people would do is that once they were back to work or if they had a change for any reason, then they could apply at that time. They're not just missing the application period for the whole year. So as we're discussing the risk factors of teachers, I know at the beginning of the pandemic, N95 masks were, you know, nowhere to be found. Is that still the case? I mean, for some, for some people, like teachers, I wonder if it would be possible to get N95 masks for them. And I, I don't know that answer. I know that, you know, we've been in this pandemic for a bit. And so perhaps they're not just going to medical workers, but I wonder if that's a possibility that we could um, provide stronger masks for um, teachers since, yeah, if, if under two, if kids aren't wearing masks, that's, that's a little, that could be a little rough. I'm not sure that's I don't right. know. Not, yeah. I don't know, like the availability. I know Greta and I talked about this before we opened back up. And I think that just, you know, the number of masks they would have to go through every day. Um, I don't know who would pay for something like that, but the centers definitely can't afford that. Um, I don't, and I, I don't know about the availability. We haven't looked into that for a long time, um, but we certainly could. Well, and I think you want to check to make sure that's the appropriate use of an N95, because I'm not sure it is. I mean, that's a whole different situation where, you know, like they said, the mask is, wearing a mask is protecting your things from coming out of you. And I don't know if it will help when the kids don't have them on and, um, you know. Um, well, I, th I think the idea of an N95 mask is that it protects you 95%. Um, but I don't, but I don't know, like, I, yeah, I, I agree. It's not, it's not a medical use, but I don't know the prevalence of, of these type of, if, if they're back to being prevalent or if they are just being used for medical purposes. I think there's well, shortages all over the country. And I think an N95 mask is not just something you pick up and learn to wear. I think there is a learning curve with how they fit because you're right, Aaron, they are supposed to protect the user, but I, I that might be a bridge too far for, you know, just, just for the, the point of using them, I think they're used in hospitals because they know how to use them also. So, but it's, I think it's something worth looking into. Kelly. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, there's a lot of newer mask type, like the plastic shields and things that um, I know some of them don't make sense to me the way the bottoms open. It seems like it doesn't do anything, but, but maybe there is, I mean, I think it's a really nice point and one that's worth taking into consideration. Is there a better quality mask that we could buy for our teachers that, you know, are working 10 hour shifts? I mean, like lots of people are, but 10 hour shifts and protecting our kids, but not being protect much protected themselves. So 
because that that could be yeah I just I see it as a place where we could be vulnerable you know and like you said we don't have extra teachers and so to keep, to keep healthy would, would be a good venture but yeah whether it's N95 or if it's some other kind of protective I don't know something that we could lend resources to we're gonna need a lot of resources going forward yeah uh hey eric one other thing uh that corey was looking for some direction on they they have a recent vacancy on the child care committee and they would like to go back uh, they did interviews uh this past january for three vacancies those were it all filled by incumbents and so they would like to go just to the next person on their list which is uh, leslie davis from timberline am i right kelly and uh, and and add her to the child care committee to fill the uh, the current vacancy. Um, but they don't feel a lot. The committee doesn't see a lot of value in going out and <laughs> reposting it at this time. So well, and the other reason it makes a lot of sense is that Heather was on there before. She's from Carriage. She's one of the admin from Carriage House, and Leslie is the executive director of Timberline. So. It makes a lot of sense to um, because Heather needed to step down, you know, to fill that with another um, provider. I think she's a great choice. She's yeah. been in Reliance since day one. You know, her she's local. I I fully support this. Is everybody else okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll let them know they can move forward with that. Okay. Uh, events committee. We got a memo from July one. Any anything <laughs> everything's either delayed or canceled so uh hearing nothing i'll take that as a that looks good to me uh we got the social equity advisory commission update and i'm gonna let uh dick and aaron with rick's help talk about this yeah i i'll start out aaron jump in wherever um we have uh, reached out to to uh, Dr. Nita um, Mosby Tyler's uh, organization, the Equity Project, and um, and Aaron Aaron was able to set up a meeting uh, with with two of her team members and Shannon and Rick, Aaron and I, and I thought we had a great meeting last Friday, um, and just kind of talked about. Um, how they approach this this type work with with uh, government organizations like us. One of one of the uh, ladies that we met with was the chief equity officer for DIA for years. Um, Dr. Tyler herself has has been a part of um, Hickenlooper's um, staff at at Denver, at City of Denver, as well as part of worked with his he and his staff on the state level um, done a tremendous amount of work with government tremendous amount of work with others um, very impressive meeting I think all four of us thought um, and they were hoping it was, it was a tight timeline they were hoping to get us back something today for this meeting but I I don't did Shannon did anything come in in the last hour <laughs> okay I don't think they did but so we're we're anxious to hear back from them, um, you know, and they they do you know a lot of assessment work. They do a lot of strategic planning um, down those these areas. You know, we talked about um, the benefit for for possibly doing some equity training for for council for all of us, and uh, I'd be very supportive of that. I think that'd be a great idea, just just to help us all kind of get off on the right foot, and then Aaron. Aaron and I, you know, along with Rick and Shannon can take it and run, but I think that would be great for, for council as well. So I'm sure Aaron's got more to add. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think an education component for all of us would be would be fantastic. We, we make the ordinances, we make the policies. And so, and also as we create this commission to have that type of support of, of the why um, behind and, um, Monica also talked about, you know, developing language 
education around language and the type of language that we use when we create policies and have conversations about social equity, I think um, is also important. It's important to know that this is a small company. It's just the three of them, Dr. Dr. Nita, Monica, and Hannah. So it's, um, and Hannah is more of an administrative role. So it's just when you work with them, and I, I believe Monica's new too, and I think Hannah is too. So, um, so we're, we'd be working, partnering with this organization right as they're starting up. And I, there was mention that they would make us a priority. I think that they are excited to work with, as they said, rural communities. Now, I know our community is a little bit special considering we're rural, but we're also ski town. We're also have a lot of visitors um, and they seem to understand that and, and, uh, and really want to work with us, which I think is exciting. I think it's a really good step. I'm curious to see what their outline looks like and what that proposal will look, look like to see if it's in line with what, uh, with what we want to accomplish. But we did spend a good amount of time talking about what we're looking to do with this committee and, and some of the um, objectives that we have and potentially speed bumps that we could run into. Well, I, I think Eric, our, you know, the process, you know, I think our, you know, I, I think we should wait until we hear um, from this organization. And then I would say the four of us will get together and, and report out what, what we may recommend for next steps. Great. Great. I'll be excited to see what they've proposed. I think this is a, thanks Gary for, uh, pushing us in this direction, I think. I've... Yeah, a question for Dick and Aaron. Would there be any value, I mean, I know the Sol Solidarity meeting event is coming up on Sunday. Uh, any value with someone from the organization with whom you've met to attend that to kind of get a, start to kind of get a, a community uh, flavor? You know, that's a, that's a great suggestion, Gary. We could reach out to them again and at least make them aware it's happening and encourage them to send someone. That, that's, yeah, no. that's a good idea. And Gary, I know that, that oh, sorry, um, that talk, at least the first talk, and I believe this talk too, I don't know why not, would be broadcast on Facebook too. So um, there might be a recording or and or they could they could even attend remotely if that's not in the cards for them to come up. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more important to, to perhaps listen to everything than actually visually see it if that's inconvenient to them. I think kind of just get a sense of what kind of enthusiasm, what kind of issues that a community like ours uh, is starting to uh, be honest about and people telling their their horror tales. Yeah, that's a great point. And we're, we're keeping FERC in the, uh, in the discussion all along on all this, right? You know, one of the FERC board members is who recommended the equity project. So, yeah, yeah, I, I would say we're they're they're certainly at the table. The, yeah, they're at the table. Excellent. So what we expect what we expect to get from them is kind of a scope of work and an outline. And usually, on these types of things, they have some timelines. Uh, of what they would expect to try to do within the first four weeks, you know, the first two months. Uh, one of the things we asked them to point out in there, knowing that kind of the creation of this commission is important to the council is, when do they think that would be an appropriate time to do that? Because not necessarily right off the bat may not be the best time to go out and do this. And, you know, then how could they assist us in that creation? Um, they stress that this is a commitment. This is a long-term commitment. Um, you know, it's, as she stated, it's eating an elephant one bite at a time, right? I mean, it, 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 you can't, it's, it, you have to have this commitment and they work, they want to work with companies that have this strong commitment for systematic change within the organization. And, you know, one of the things that they would start, I mean, right now, I think Dr. Nita is booking out six weeks in a, you know, before she can even come in and probably do the training and that, but probably within a couple weeks of entering into some agreement, they'll start, they'll start 
crunching data and analyzing stuff. And that's where they really start to kind of look for some, do their gaps analysis based off of, I mean, every probably looking at everything that we touch relative to even how we do, you know, childcare scholarships to everything that we touch and, and is, you know, is there anything in there that's not inclusive and et cetera. So they, they have a bit of a system that they've used in other places, which will work well, but I think I like the idea that they're kind of a startup. Um, I got a feeling they're going to be real busy soon. And if we can latch on sooner than later, I think it's an advantage. And, um, you know, there's a little name recognition working with Breckenridge, which they really thought Dr. Nita would, uh, would want to be a, a big part of this community and working with it. So, um, I, you know, I, I kind of like the idea that they're, they're a bit of a uh, startup. They certainly have the experience and credentials in their other walks of life. And now they're just really molding that into a consulting business that's probably due to the, the times we're living in is going to become pretty successful, I would imagine. So. All right. Any other questions? Nice job, guys. That's, uh, that's a great start. Can't wait to see what. Yeah, well, uh, w once we get something, we'll share it with you electronically. I'm not sure we want to wait two weeks to make a decision. I think, and Dick and Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I think we were assuming that everything kind of lines up the way we think it would, and it seems reasonable. Uh, I mean, I. Is this, is this a company that we're going to recommend that we probably want to work with with this council? I think so. I mean, it depends on it depends on their proposal for sh for sure. I mean, I, I don't think we can I don't think we can publicly say that we'll definitely go with them without seeing a proposal. But yeah, I, I think from that conversation, I'm excited. I think that it's a great step. I think it's a it's a step in the right direction. And yeah, I, it's exciting. Um, but yeah, I, there was nothing from that conversation that would make me doubt that we would go with them. Um, but I'm, I'm interested to see what, what the oh, proposal is. I would say that about anybody we talk to. Yeah, right. I, I agree with Aaron. I, I got a great feeling with our first meeting with them. Plus we've gotten two, two independent positive references from our community who have worked with, with her and that organization in the past. So I, Everything is, is positive at this point. We'll just have to see the, the proposal. All right. Uh, okay, let's move on to the transit options with North Gondola redevelopment. Rick? All right. Uh, we are going to bring on um, our presenters for this. So who do we got here? So we bring in Mike Dudick over in, uh, Graham and Bill Campy are going to be brought over into the panelist group. Uh, then, uh, you got a little taste in your packet of, uh, of some of what they're going to do, but I'll let, uh, I'll let Mike kind of introduce the uh, presentation, short presentation that they want, kind of looking for some feedback from the town council. So, Mike, you want to activate your video? And there you are. Maybe you should unactivate it again. Oh, wow. There's a good looking man right there. <laughs> You were talking before I activated my video, I assume. <laughs> What's up, number one? Just acting tough, looking buffed. Yeah, I like your shirt. Did you get yeah, that from oh. So, do you have, is Campy here? He should be here any minute. He had a tight schedule, so he we told him four thirty. But we'll, he can. Uh, I was going to do the presentation, so he can just join in when he gets here. He texted uh, me that he's on. Do you not see him, Rick? We do not see him, Graham. Okay, I'll, I'll get with him. I just, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. There, there he is now, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just got to share. I'll share my video. 
Am I the only one wearing a suit? What's going on here? Yeah, you know, what, what, are you and you and knock? <laughs> wow. How did, your sen- how did your sentencing hearing go today? <laughs> you're not looking for approval tonight. You get denied just for wearing a suit to work. That's what I expected. I don't know if he works person. with us anymore after That's that. Perfect. I can tell you that, Eric. Yeah. Uh, you know you got to know your audience, buddy. That's the deal. <laughs> I did this just for you, Eric. I think, isn't this what you wear to go mountain biking most days? He came to my house today and dropped off a watchtower pamphlet. <laughs> now, uh, Mike, you might want to introduce your team. Some yeah. newer council may not be familiar. Yeah, with. for sure. So, um, Graham Frank is well. Campy is just uh, disrobed. Um, we'll just stop right there. So, Campy's DTJ Design and has done a lot of work in the past on behalf uh, for. I met Bill when I was on council when he was doing. I think you came with a. Uh, gondola throughout the community plan all those years ago and before that you were you worked on the master plan with eric and i don't know who else that is legacy from those days that worked on the master plan for the gondola lots you know 10 to 15 years ago Um, but bill's been intimately involved with town projects and um, is helping us with a redevelopment game plan for the gondola lots graham uh, many of you guys know is uh, takes care of all the real estate development for BGV and um, led the you know early completion of our third building up at the base of Peak Eight. Um, I hope you guys can say early completion when you get done with your massive capital project too. Um, it's a fun it's a fun thing to be able to say. And then also I think on the line are. Um, Holly Buck and Elizabeth Adams from FHU. I don't know. I know Holly said she was going to be here. And you guys are familiar with FHU because they've done work on behalf of the town with the, with respect to the Watson roundabout. Um, so we've kind of, I don't know, incestuously integrated people that you're familiar with and are working on town projects into what we're working on in the spirit of trying to make sure we get this thing dialed in the right way, community benefit way up front. So that's who we have. I wanna um, also thank the town staff that, I see some of the names that are participating, um, Shannon Smith and um, James Phelps, um, Chris McGinnis, Truckee's on, I see Truckee on there. Um, Rick, of course, sat in with the meetings. We had three meetings with staff and then we had a kind of pre-presentation meeting about 10 days ago, where we would kind of walk through the different options that you guys see in your packet with respect to a transit center redesign. Um, so, Graham, are you gonna, how are you gonna run the, the um, how do you run the PDF, the presentation file? So Rick, it says that my uh, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Is there a way to enable that? Chris, will you share it with Graham? Graham, you should see that now. Got it. Thank you, Chris. So, Graham, you can see. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So, introductions, and Graham, if you move to the next slide. Um, One sec, Mike. It's okay. No, let me. There we go. So this is a, obviously a satellite shot, field conditions existing today. Um, kind of on the left-hand third, you can see the horseshoe configuration of the existing transit center as it is today. Um, and below that, the um, Breck Station building. Um, we are under contract to purchase the Ga- North Gondola lot and the, the triangular wedge across the street known as the Gold Rush lot. Um, the Gold Rush lot, as you guys primarily know, it is the parking spaces that you see in this photograph, but it's also a massive chunk of land to the south that is wetlands. Um, Well, it turns out that global warming is true because they're not as wet as what they were um, years ago. Um, There's some opportunity in there for some park development, which we'll get to in a bit. But so those two wedges is what we're looking at with Vail Resorts. Um, 2009, The town um, did at the master plan. Um, What we wanna do is kind of restate the master plan in consideration of a new transit center in addition to 
the uh, parking structure that you guys are building or the town is building on South Gondola. Um, I want to be clear on this, that any, tra any, any change to the transit center and the, and the footprint that it sits upon is going to result in a change to the ground lease between the property owner and the town. Okay. And so, so once you, you can't be kind of pregnant with this, once you decide to change the transit center, I mean, I think staff will confirm this, that any change that you make is going to entail changing the ground lease. And so, um, once you cross the bridge and say we're, we want to change the transit center, we're going to change the ground lease as well and work together to figure out how that's going to work. And so I, I don't want you to think that because one option has less of an infringement on a new space for a ground lease that that entails any less of a change than more land does. They all require um, a new ground lease. So once you go outside of the footprint that you see in the blue on this slide. So we're buying all of this land that's denoted by the hash, the purple hashes, and then the current ground lease between the town and Vail Resorts is denoted in the blue. And, and the um, only caveat to you guys' earlier discussion, obviously this land here, we've already had the discussion with Vail Resorts that that is earmarked Rick for the Watson roundabout project. So that's not highlighted here, but that's earmarked in all of our plans. And, and so, and I want to be, so the ground lease will change, but I also want to be clear to everybody on this call. I do not have an ask from the town of Breckenridge. I'm not here to ask for more density or any, anything. I'm just, I'm here as a, as a developer, a community player to, redevelop the transit center in a, in a way that I think is best for the community. And I literally do not have, I don't have anything on a piece of paper that says this is what I want in exchange for that, zero. So we want to, I want them here to work together with the town to figure out what the best solution is for the community and get direction from this council as to what you guys think the best transit solution and option is for the community. Um, so one of the things that happened when we went um, initially through this with, with staff was that we weren't really showing what generally what we wanted to do from a development standpoint. And that wasn't very productive because I think that understanding at a high level uh, what we would intend to do is helpful to understand how the transit solution would work and to work together to create a good community-based solution. So these next few slides were not in your packet. Um, we'll go through them to give you a high level overview of what this development could potentially look like. Understanding that we have icons on these slides because we're not even gonna put bubbles down for where buildings would go. These are general conceptual concept, general conceptual ideas that will get very much so further refined once we get more direction from the town. So Graham, if you go to the next page. So one of the first things that we'd have to do, obviously, is, is and throw in any questions if you have them along the way, if you want as well. Um, we would have to replace the parking that currently exists to the tune of 600 parking spaces on the North Gondola parcel and approximately 360 when fully parked on the Gold Rush lot. So we call it a thousand parking space structure across the street on the North Gondola. So that's a requirement of, of Vail Resorts. So no net increase in parking, just a replacement so you free up the land um, for buildings. We would move people from the parking structure to the gondola via an over, not, not yet, via an, over, um, via an overpass from the parking structure, pedestrian walking overpass, and or a platter cabriolet lift, an open, open lift. The, the idea of rerouting the existing gondola so it touches down on a parking structure and then ascends again is not going to work from an engineering standpoint. So the al best alternatives are an overpass for walking that would ingress and egress from the structure. So you wouldn't have to go down to ground and then up to get to the structure, get to the bridge. You would ingress and egress from the structure onto the bridge and then down to the gondola if you were going skiing. 
up to up to the bridge if you're returning from skiing and straight across into the parking structure. Um, and then a platter and or cabriolet, cabriolet lift and open air lifts so that people can cross over to the gondola without having to do the walking. And then the next element that we would add would be the roundabouts. And you guys are doing the roundabout at Watson and Park. And we think that for a lot of different reasons, a roundabout is going to be an essential part of this deal at Park and French. I understand the fiduciary responsibility and the community responsibility that you guys have relative to developer coming in and saying we're going to build a roundabout. As you guys consider these different options, I want you to be assured that I understand how important it is to have a, a high degree of certainty that the roundabout will be built pursuant to your um, redesign the transit center. And we will work with Rick to formulate a solution that satisfies the certainty requirement that I know you guys, you have a, you have a responsibility to do that to the community. And so I'm aware of that. We'll get there. I just, you know, there's some cons listed in the other options, options two and three that it requires a roundabout. I'm sitting here telling you we're going to do a roundabout and we'll figure out a way that you know that that's going to happen pursuant to your responsibility to the community um, in evaluation of this. So two roundabouts, one, one at Watson, one at French. Ideally, they would be constructed concurrently. We've talked about this before as a, and potentially detouring through like in the summer months or spring or fall months and creating a detour through the uh, North Gondola lot so that the traffic disruption is for a limited period of time and, um, you know, a 10 week or three month period of time, but that it, we don't have massive disruption of traffic throughout the community to construct the roundabouts and just get it done and be, and be done with them. Uh, the next slide would be pursuant to creating really good, strong pedestrian connections. Um, you know, obviously the bridge at the parking structure and then bridges on the east side of the property co to connect um, all of the gondola pedestrian traffic to Main Street in a much easier fashion. I know that one of the goals of the south gondola parking structure was connectivity to Main Street for the skiers. And we just want to further enhance uh, that opportunity to get people from skiing to Main Street. Um, I feel like that's what I've heard. I, I believe that the intention here is to have that be a community benefit, community focus. Uh, on the next slide, where you see uh, right there, workforce housing, here's the deal with workforce housing. There's, we're going to end up owning the land. BGV will work with the town um, to create the greatest number of units that are economically and socially feasible there. Um, these are going to, these can be great workforce housing units because we can create a walk to, ride your bike to, ride your bus to, ride the gondola to work without having to get in your car and add more vehicular congestion to the core of downtown. We can do things like metering the ingress and egress of vehicles to, you know, ostensibly charge the residents to move their vehicles out at certain times or in at certain times of the day. Uh, so we can, we can craft a solution working with the community to have minimal vehicular impact from the workforce housing and really would look to guidance from the town council as to the size and scope of workforce housing that is, would be truly deed restricted, not any of this deal where half of it's deed restricted and half of it's for sale and all that kind of stuff, but true workforce housing um, that, that, you know, in a number that's prescribed and agreed to between BGV and the town of Breckenridge. Uh, and then next is what is now the dry lands uh, or mostly dry. We think there's a real opportunity here to provide access to a big chunk of land in town to create a, a public park wetland or dry lands experience to move people through trails and, bri and walking bridges like you even have today in Cucumber Gulch um, to be able to experience additional parts of the community. And so we wanna leave a large chunk of this parcel available to the community as a benefit so that people can uh, walk through it and enjoy more of Breckenridge. And then finally, um, there obviously would be residential components on the North Gondola site. 
the, the size and scope of those are limited by the SFEs that exist. And again, I'm not asking for anything other than what the SFE count is there today. Um, and, um, and then the other limiting factor or controlling factor is what does the transit center look like? Um, and so if you flip to the final page on this, um, you know, our vision with this uh, guys, especially in light of COVID, one of the major trends in, in my industry and in hospitality is to have, have thematic components to uh, hospitality. And so we would look to make this a, a wellness village that is, you know, mind, body, community kind of focused uh, with, you know, offices for nonprofits that are focusing like a building hope kind of place like we would propose with the BOEC up at the hotel site. In addition to, uh, you know, travel, a lot of travel today is based on people's desire to have a wellness component to it. So it's not just a, you know, you come and get drunk at the bar kind of place anymore. That's not our intentions and then go skiing. Um, so that's the whole picture of what we're going to do. Um, before I go on to the transit, do you guys have any questions for me on this? You know, or we can just go to the transit. Yeah, Michael, I, I know this is, uh, am I on? Yeah, I know this is, you know, a preliminary. On, on the bridge, will that, uh, you th is it either or the bridge or the Cabriolet? And w if it was a bridge, would it, or the, all the bridges, would it be, they be covered? Um, haven't gotten to the covered question yet. Um, the cabriolet and the bridge is probably both. Okay. Um, locations on these icons are placeholders. So let's, we're not going to pick the color of the paint on the car today. We're just, yep, we're, they're yep. placeholders. There's going to be bridges, but not bridges. And sure. so it'd be probably both is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm a little confused about the building hope reference. Is that, are they offices for building hope? No, I'm just saying by way of example, Aaron, that we okay. want to have a wellness village. And if, you know, if, if organization like that, uh, I just use them not specifically, I use them in general, you know, theoretical sense that I shouldn't have said their name, but, you know, okay. fill in any nonprofit organization that's community centric, we want that to be part of a, a community based wellness village. So that's one of our intentions with this is to be very community centric with with some of the at, you know some of the additional components to this development okay thank you so mike are you gonna narrow this down a little bit like tell us what you want us to consider yes okay that's, that's the next that's the next few slides and so the the question today in the work with the thank you for setting me up kelly the question for today is is transit option one, transit option two, A or B, or transit option three, um, and then then your choice on those one, two, or three, then dovetail into more specific direction of what we come back to you with respect to a master plan, a very tight master plan proposal for the future. So, but, the, but you'll, you can see how, as we walk through these and you look through the, in the packet, how the different transit solutions and the use of land can, you can imagine how it would dramatically change the placement of buildings and where things, where facilities would go for the bus drivers, restrooms, break rooms, things like that. It depends on the solution, the transit roadway option that you guys prefer for the buses. So with that said, there's no other questions. This is transit option one that you're looking at right now, which shows um, Shannon did a great job outlining the pros and cons of this in the packet. This has entrances on Watson and on Park Avenue and exits on both of those as well. Um, and then, you know, it's a, it's a cleaner version of the horseshoe that you currently have, but in my mind, it still has massive amounts of pod potential pedestrian conflict. Um, you can see with the buses going uh, multi directions. Um, and then it's also conflict on Watson with cars egressing from your new parking structure and buses. Um, it is better, I think everyone in staff agrees than what we have today with the horseshoe on um, the south end of the North Gondolot parcel. Um, but I think, I personally think it's the least attractive of the three options that you're going to see. 
This does not require a roundabout initially at Park and French because you have the um, you have the ability to go north and south out of the out of this configuration of traffic pattern. Mike, could you let us know what each of these blocks are? Just to be clear. Sure. Okay. So the can you move the arrow down, Grant? We're in different rooms. <laughs> so this, okay, so just north of his, just to the left of his arrow, the, the pink blocks are buses. Those are buses. The arrows, the green arrow right next to that, and the purple arrows indicate the direction of the traffic. The gray boxes, the rectangular gray boxes are just placeholders for transit facilities, where the bigger gray box is the gondola station. These would all obviously be modified and refined when, once we select a solution. The footprints show you the distance, the walking distance from the gondola to the furthest northernmost bus. So 260 feet um, of walking or Campy told me yesterday that the average person can cover 100 feet in 20 seconds. So less than 60 seconds of walking in ski boots. Okay, so the big gray block is the gondola. Yep. And then that rectangle, that gray rectangle right there is the transit yep. station. What's the little gray box? Like a shelter. A shelter, okay, Like a, it. Like those raft of things that you guys have seen. Okay, thank you. Pink are buses, and then green and purple arrows indicate direction of traffic. <laughs> and this is the major crosswalk across. Um, and, and we saw this as one of the biggest negatives because you have buses moving both directions as people cross this crosswalk to get to the island to catch this line of buses. But that's what the purple denotes. And then the 650 feet here denotes the walking distance to the egress of the south gondola structure that's being built okay thank so, you so kelly so this is choice one of the of the you know we and when we wrap this up to ask questions of the council let's choose one two a two b or three so this is choice one um if we can move on to choice two so this is two a which is also one and two are favored by staff um this has as you can see um, single direction traffic for the buses, those are the green arrows moving from south to north. Um, the pink again delineates the 12 buses, which is a request to staff to have 12 buses um, in the solution. Um, entrance off of Watson, exit onto Park Avenue with, a gone, with the roundabout to loop, loop buses back to the south, if that's the direction they're heading. James made a great point when we had a, this meeting a week and a half ago was that this solution allows the transit authority to use the different islands to delineate north and southbound bus traffic so as to make the wayfinding easier for the people using the buses. Um, again, 320 feet of walking from the furthest northbound bus back to the gondola. And Aaron, the two rectangular grays again delineate um, bus temp, you know, bus uh, transit stations, shelters, uh, you know, break rooms, restrooms for drivers and whatnot. This does require the, the pedestrians to cross one lane of bus traffic to get um, from the east to the west side to the westernmost uh, lane of traffic for buses. Um, but it does have single direction movement of the buses um, as opposed to the solution one, which has uh, multi-direction movement of the buses and makes one look a lot like what we currently have today in the horseshoe. Questions? You said staff likes one and two. Yep. What do they think about 2A? Um, I, I think- He they, means 2A, Jeffrey. Two and two. Pardon me? We only have 2A, so this oh, is- Oh, okay, so there isn't a two. two. I'll show you 2B. Graham will show you 2B right now. Can you? Yeah, but I'm asking Michael. You, you said the, the staff prefers one and two. So what what you what you meant is the staff uh, prefers one and two A. Is there a two and a two A? There's a there's a two there's a two A and a two B. 
Oh, that confuses things. Yeah, okay. I know. So, so what, is the, four what is the staff? What is the staff? Are they like one and two A? I think the two B is the preferred. I don't want to okay. put words in Shannon's mouth because two B allows the difference between two A and two B is that you ingress into the bus queue from the roundabout right. versus Watson. And so to yeah. use another thing I learned from Campy yesterday, this allows you to zipper traffic, you know, closing a zipper, um, leaving, the, leaving the parking structure and heading northbound. Buses coming in, they alternate through. So you don't have the, the left-hand turn conflict that you have with the entrance on Watson you get the same benefits of the double stack of the islands, but less vehicular tra traffic conflict on Watson. The hey Mike, I think we're a little confused because we didn't have 2B in our packet. Right. Is that one still being considered or no? It is, we're, we're, we're trying to work, we're gonna work with CDOT to see if that is, I apologize for not having it in there. We're working with CDOT to make sure that we can do that. We think that it's very likely um, but um, that's the reason why you didn't have it. So we've, we've added that. Um, but the, so the difference between the three, let me, let me try and create some clarity. Option one is gonna have the multi-direction movement of the buses. Option two is gonna have the two islands and option with one direction of movement of buses. Option three is gonna have one movement of buses and one lane of bus traffic. So really the difference between the three options is the direction of the buses and the number of lanes of bus traffic. I would, I would also add, Mike, the difference would be also act, manner of access and egress in terms of left turn right. room versus uh, yeah, everybody's been in a roundabout. You understand how that works in terms of traffic flow versus a turn movement, which is different um, in terms of access. And then, you know, I think at the end of this, Mike, I'll talk to you just kind of the, some of the community design principles that we're looking at. Um, and what, why um, some of these options that move the buses out. I'll talk more about that because I think that's also a contributing factor when we look at the whole property. All right, thanks. And then one last thing, Kelly, if you look at the last page of Shannon's packet, you'll see in that blow up on the last page, it bifurcates out 2A and 2B in that Zoom scenario. And the reason we did that is it's just the nuances of the CDOT approval of it coming off of the roundabout. So you can actually kind of see them side by side on that last page of the packet. Let's go to the third option. And Thanks. Like, like I alluded to, this is a sing this is access off of the roundabout, a singular lane of bus traffic with a sawtooth pattern for parking the buses, an exit into a park in French roundabout. Um, and multiple options for exiting there that this option has 10 not 12 buses and this option has 520 feet of pedestrian walking travel from the gondola to the north furthest northbound bus bus stations again denoted by the rectangular elements um so those are the three in the gram if you just want to why don't you just skip forward to the one that has all three yeah there you go so this to try and you know try and put a ribbon around the box and not have as much confusion. Option one on the left has two directions of bus traffic um, and in, ingress and egress points on both Watson and Park Avenue. Option two is two islands, and the difference between A and B is where the buses enter the queue. They either enter off Watson or they enter from the roundabout. And option three is a single lane of bus traffic. With no pedestrian conflict is the is the big bonus to option three. There's no kids walking walking behind or in front of buses that are eventually going to move. We do think there's an the opportunity to add two two bus lanes along Watson for option three to get to the twelve. Currently, um, there isn't twelve spaces in your current facility. I I think that's a if I understand it, a future expansion possibility or or maybe it's coming sooner than later. But um, just keep in mind that we. We believe we could get to 12 by pl placing two, like for example, the Main Street trolley um, could be on a Watson. So it had this kind of own special spot uh, as a pull off. So there are some options I believe to expand that. And With respect to option three, when a bus gets ready to depart, 
Does it have to back out first, get into the lane, and then proceed? No, no. It's a the great radius is it. there to to crank left and pull out. Okay. It's a pretty standard configuration in a lot of larger areas, Gary. Okay. One of the concerns that staff had with this was the maintenance of the busways with the sawtooth. Um, that if we, if you were to prefer option three, that we would want to investigate further the making sure that we can move the snow in a way that uh, makes sense. One of the things I will note too, that in the discussions with the staff that we did at all three of these options was pull the traffic lanes for the buses more to the east to, so that we can create more of a buffer along part between Park Avenue and the buses on the west side of the, of the traffic lanes for the buses. And one of the things we're doing for option three as well for James is we're pulling all of the data from the new transit stop at building three of Grand Colorado because that's heated to say what is the cost benefit analysis of heating that sawtooth to eliminate all the storage needs and maintenance needs for those buses in and out. You know, and, and on the just to go back real quick to the roundabout side of things, you know, historically, when we did Grand Colorado Peak 8, the, you know, everyone can remember what that knuckle was up there at the end of Ski Hill Road before you went over to Peak 7, that goofy increase in elevation and funky, you know, uh, S like turn there. And one of the things that we did as part of that project was to regrade the entire Ski Hill Road from that bridge all the way down in front of one Ski Hill place. And so we do have experience relative to the roundabout of delivering on the roadway improvements in a way that that we were get it done. So again, on the roundabout, um, I, 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 will I, I will promise to make that a moot point or non-issue relative to the transit solution. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, hey, hey Eric. Um, I guess I have a broader kind of process question. I. I mean, I appreciate Mike's offer to build the French Street roundabout, but uh, I'm assuming you're not going to want to do that unless we come to some kind of development agreement to do the whole the whole thing. So I don't know how we can make this decision now. Um, I, I personally think one's better than what we have now, so I could live with one. Um, you know, I think two may be an improvement, but I don't think we really are going to know whether we can do two for quite some time. I mean, a long time, because I'm not interested in making this decision in a bubble, you know, with the ramifications of we, we have, I mean, two and three require the roundabout on, on uh, French Street. So I, you know, from a process standpoint, I, I'm not seeing from land use, from a land use standpoint, I'm not seeing a huge difference between one and two. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we, we proceed with our design of the Watson roundabout and just, you know, let this process continue. Um, I, I don't know how we can make this decision right at the front of this process. So um, I'm not a fan of three, I, I you know, from a sustainability thing, we're trying to heat less concrete, you know, I've, you know, when we talked about this in, in the gondola design stuff, the sawtooth public works does not like it all from a snow removal standpoint, unless we heat the concrete. So, so I, and plus three is, is just way, way too far away um, from the, the parking structure as well as downtown. So I'm, I guess I rule out three right off the bat. I'm between one and two, and I can live with one. I think one's an improvement for sure. Um, two is intriguing, but gosh, I, I wouldn't be prepared to make that decision, you know, for a long time. I think we got to look at the, the big picture, so. Well, if I can interject, keep in mind that either one or two um, is going gonna, is gonna to trigger a renegotiation of the land lease. Right, because they both. They well, I, both, yeah, which which means there's a third or fourth option, and that is do nothing. You with what we've been doing, right? Yeah, working on and, in the current lease area, 
for quite some time and there is no consideration to that in any of these that that is also an option is to con continue what we have been doing, which requires no change in a lease. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I agree with Dick that this is our first blush at this, Mike, and I really appreciate you taking the time. But um, first, we're hearing about an additional roundabout. Um, and I really want to hear more from staff other than read what they had to say, because they're the people that are in the know, not us. Other questions for Mike or Graham? And I was just going to add, Eric, you know, in our discussions, uh, you and I on that design group, you know, with, with the uh, parking structure, what, a, a year or more ago, you know, Vail Resorts expressed a lot of desire to work with us on reworking the transit center because it certainly benefits them enormously. So I am certain that we can, we can get that done. Yeah, I don't, I don't think my, my input is going to be particularly meaningful since I move off of council at the, at the end of the month. Um, I'd like to hear it anyway, Gary. Um, yeah, in a perfect world, um, I mean, I'm, at this point, this information has come to us very, very quickly. So I think it's uh, not unreasonable to say, well, I think we need, need some breathing time. But I'll tell you, of all of the uh, transit options, um, and I may be the only one, um, I kind of liked to be, assuming you could get CDOT to play ball, only because you're not having to dick around uh, on Watson and you're, you're coming right off of the uh, roundabout in a very straightforward fashion, double laned. Uh, it just kind of strikes me as being uh, potentially the most efficient. Um, but then again, it's like asking, you know, we're in a, you know, we're in a, you know, federal science class and I've got a biology degree and someone's saying, hey, why don't you help us make some uh, rocket fuel? So I'm not, I'm not really, I don't think many of any of us on council with the exception of probably Eric, who's been on a planning commission and has done a lot of this stuff. I really don't know just, you know, how relevant our input is and uh, really need to take a big lead from, uh, uh, you know, our staff. So that's my two cents, <laughs> probably the last you hear from me about this project. Good two cents, Gary. Erin? Yeah, so a couple things. I'm a little confused. I hear Dick saying that there will be a development agreement, but it sounded like from Mike that there won't be a development agreement. So if well, there is development- I don't think what? right now. I, I think we right now, no, I think right now all that Mike is asking for is there's a potential lease negotiation for the piece of property outside of the blue leased area that we currently have. That's really what's before us today. Everything okay. else he talked about is really just a heads up. This is what I might be planning to do. The okay. problem with that is Sorry. that some of this hinges on this roundabout, two and three hinge on a roundabout that is gonna be part of that later discussion so okay so i guess and i know that this is a chicken or egg thing but i agree with dick that i'd like to know more about the development agreement um before deciding on this i mean what one of the reasons too is because of that this other roundabout i wonder if the development agreement or whatever is going being built if that pushes cdot to require um two lanes and so then what does that do to the roundabout? I could be totally off. I agree. I'm not, I'm not an engineer in this way, but I, I'd like to know more information. And I, I get it. This is our first blush, but that's, that's my impression right now. Jeffrey? You know, I'll, I'll defer to the staff on this. If they, if they, it, it all looks fairly similar to me. I mean, I know it's, I know it's a different configuration, different feng shui, but if the staff likes 2A, 
then that's that's what I would I would kind of go along with that with the caveat that that doesn't commit us to anything else else other than offering an opinion. Kelly. Um, so does the staff like 2A? Is that what they prefer? Rick? You're muted, bud. Rick, you're muted. There you go. I know. Thank you. Um, we probably, I mean, we liked 2 and then we leaned for 2B because we liked, if we can make it work, we like the ability of the cars to come right off the roundabout and not have to come down into Watson. Uh, we see we see a lot of advantage in getting that mix of people and cars and transit off of Watson um, because that's one of the current problems we have. So, um, you know, if it's an opinion based on nothing else because all you're doing is saying, you know, here's what we know now when we look at these, what do we think? Uh, you know, there's some simplicity to three, but we think three put its limits to buses. It pushes it out too far. We've always felt that way. It's just not a good feeling for those buses out that far. And then we like the singular direction and the simplicity with less conflicts on two. And then like 2B is where, uh, you know, is a kind of a last minute little altercation we had them uh, look at to see about, you know, we said, well, on three, if they could come right off the roundabout on three, why couldn't they do that on two? And that's what created 2B. So that's probably where we would lean the staff right now. So 2B, then, I amend my opinion to two. I thought I thought they liked 2A, but too big. Too big. <laughs> well, not 2B. Well, I... Go ahead. Did you have a question? I had a question. So with 2B, I... I agree with the left turn or, or lacking of the left turn, but the way that it's, and maybe these are just not scientific, but could that get backed up into the roundabout at all? Since there's one lane there breaking off into two? Well, th this is, there's so many unknowns at this time. There's, there's a good likelihood that uh, it wouldn't surprise me if C dot, I mean, both of these roundabouts were, would be required to be two lane roundabouts and then you got single lane in between. It, there's a good chance C dot could require uh, four lane in, in between the two roundabouts just so that it does, because it doesn't make sense for that short a distance uh, to go back from single into a double roundabout again. We don't know that, that's a C dot issue. Um, so. So, Go ahead, even for even for option one, though, it requires uh, some sort of a modification to the land lease because the bubble that we're currently operating in is smaller, right? Correct. That's the blue area. So, okay. But, so, what does that mean? I mean, can we just go back and request this other, or like, when, when would that expire? Could we just keep operating in the current land lease forever? Yes. Right now, the current land lease will carry, if the land lease that we have for transit operations is in basically perpetuity. Um, so as long as we stay within that blue area, um, that, I mean, I haven't pulled it and looked at it recently, but that, that I'm sure that area, that area will go with the, the, the selling whatever the transaction is on the transfer of ownership of that property. So we would, as long if we want to keep or alter our transit within that blue area, we could do so without altering the, the land lease. Um, and Kelly, and what do we have to do to alter the land lease? We enter into a lease agreement and, you know, who, the pro I mean we did we were doing sketches on napkins right with Eric and myself and the group uh, when we were doing the the land lease with Bell Resorts for the South Gondola a lot trying to you know come up with some transit options because we know transit is problematic it, it does it work for us yeah it work it works but it could work a heck of a lot better um, so we, you know, we were at that time, we were trying to say, look, 
you know, Vail Resorts, you still own this property. Are you willing to talk to us about altering, you know, the land lease for transit? And they said, well, we're open to discussing it, but we couldn't, you know, we didn't, we couldn't come up with the right solution. So, you know, it's at some point, if it hasn't already, <laughs> that ownership is going to shift and who you're dealing with changes. So, and Rick, I think that's an important point. We're the goal of this is to perpetuate that discussion because as we discussed, the next step for us is coming in with a master plan that sets the pieces that we desire, but obviously the desired transit solution defines those boundaries in which we should plan on attempting to develop. So that was the goal here by no means to come in to attempt to renegotiate the lease. It was for when we come in with the next step, which is a master plan application, that Bill's team has planned accordingly and placed, you know, the pedestrian connectivity, bus connectivity, all of those things as we look at the comprehensive pieces, we were just looking for feedback. We weren't looking for the council to make a decision today and say, we want option B, renegotiate the land lease. It was give us feedback and parameters so that as we come in with the next application, which all of this is part of a comprehensive, that was the goal of today to get that feedback. If, I'm, if I may, um, just, you know, having been through this process on both sides of the table, the, the desire here was to have a dialogue with the town council to, to hear, because once I make an application, then, you know, then there's this wall that goes up between me and the, the town council and the staff and all that. And so part of my visioning, having you know, done a lot of different stuff in this community was to say, how can we do this better and different? And to try and talk through, because um, when you guys get a master plan or a building, you're just reacting to what the developer gives you. And they say here, and you react. And what I'm trying to do is to try and have that be a better process to say, at this point in time, what do you like better? And so to go back to what Eric said earlier, question one is, do you want to change the transit system or the transit center, right? And that's the first question. Are you willing to change the, tra the transit center? And then question two is how, um, and it sounds like, you know, based on Shannon and Rick and based on what we're looking at too, that, that 2B ultimately is where this can land and we can make some more refinements to this. So you guys have the opportunity of time to, to digest this at a later point. You've seen it once, we continue the dialogue and get some more input from you guys and you understand more. I wanted to give you an overview of what would happen with the development in totality up front. So you're not just operating in the dark. Um, I don't think it's legitimate or fair to do it that way. Um, but really, I think it comes down to two questions. One, do you want to change the transit system at the center? And two, which, which version would you lean towards? And then we can come back with more dialogue to further vet this, this, and, that, and obviously there's other considerations, but that's the direction we're hoping to get to today. I can just add one thing, Mike, in terms of process too. I think it's important to know that we, we, we need to, there's a, another factor in CDOT in this conversation that I think it's really helpful to hear, have some prep, it's hard, you don't, you don't wanna bring CDOT four or five, six options, right? We wanna kind of be able to start having a dialogue with them about not only the other roundabout, but, but what transit, how that transit might change so that when we're planning the project to think about all the stuff we would be start thinking about pedestrian movement, uh, community design, the extension of Main Street, all the values that we've had throughout this whole thing. We'll also have some sense of um, what we can achieve with in terms of CDOT's interaction. I, Dick, you yeah, that, makes, that, that makes a lot of sense, Mike and Bill. I, I appreciate you you're coming in and I, Hopefully we've given you feedback. I mean, I think a lot of the, the, the land that we're, we're talking about here, and, and Bill, I appreciate that you guys having your communications with CDOT. Um, you know, you need some direction for that. I, um, you know, I, I think the, as far as the land use, you know, the differences between 2B and 1 is really, we're talking about undevelopable land. I mean, it's all stuff underneath the gondola. So it's it's not like it's gonna change your master plan much, I wouldn't think. So, you know, I think, um, yeah, as far as CDOT goes, um, 
Yeah, I think, I don't know. I feel like we've given you some pretty good input, so. Well, so I guess I'd just like to say that, you know, I don't know if you're counting votes or how you're doing this at this point, but I feel um, similar to Dennis, which is this um, roundabout, the additional roundabout is, um, I just don't know enough about it. And I just can't, I don't know enough about it to understand how it weighs into whether I, we should prefer uh, an option two or an option one. So I guess my preference would be to get some more information on, you know, what the impacts of that, what the benefits of that are before we actually, that would stand. Here's one of the things that I think is a little different on this than what we normally see. Usually what we would be doing right now is we would just be renegotiating for a lease for a chunk of land that we would then develop on. But instead, Mike has developed some options for us. That's sort of backwards to how we normally do business. And what is out of this conversation is what currently we have been working on with the current lease. Because we have done multiple versions of different things that need to be in this conversation because whether you like them or not, you probably will not like them. They are integral to the conversation about how this works going forward. There is a pretty strong assumption that Mike will end up owning this land, but nobody knows in this town what is going to happen in November of this year right now. So to make any decisions on anything based on what little we know about the economy of our community into this winter, I got to tell you, I think is a little premature. As far as these options go, you know, I agree. I think two makes more sense. There is a lot of it that is, like Dick says, underneath the, the lift line. And when we were having discussions with the ski area about this lease, that's what we talked about because they didn't want to take any value away from what they own. So the, the discussion there is where the gondola cable goes, there's a, there's a right away that goes on either side of that cable and you cannot build anything within that right away. That is, for all intents and purposes, you can use that to park cars, but that is truly all you can do there or you can move, move buses. So, so what am I saying? I'm saying that um, I would like to have um, Tim Berry um, give this council a little primer on um, Sort of steps and policies that I think will be very important for, you know, in particular, Dennis and Kelly uh, and maybe Dick, just as far as where we are, what goes on, what happens if Mike comes in with a development agreement as opposed to what happens if Mike comes in with just a project, which are two totally different, or, you know, if, if we have to ha enter into some kind of different agreement, and there's always a Quid pro quo, is this part of it? Will this be part of it? Um, so I, I think there is more information that the council needs to hear and see. And honestly, I, I have no problem like going into a negotiation, a lease negotiation um, that may not take into account any of these. Maybe it's a totally different configuration, so. Okay. Um, well, I think what, I think what we'll do is, uh, is refine and answer more questions, try and focus on 2B as the preferred choice. And then with 2B, I understand there to be a, 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 a variety of issues that need to be further vetted and more deeply understood by all members of the council, including whoever Gary's replacement is going to be um, to understand that in the scope of the big thing, the total picture on this parcel. So I think that there are legitimate questions to be understood about how the buses move and, you know, what CDOT's going to require on Park Avenue relative to four lanes versus two lanes. CDOT, I don't know that if anybody knows CDOT might well, we got to understand what CDOT wants with respect to a roundabout at Park Avenue in French. It might be right. beyond um, some future decision making for anybody on this call, right? CDOT might say you need to have that. And um, I don't know that as we sit here today. So 
we will focus on 2B um, and try and come up with a more detailed presentation for the council so you understand the ramifications, try and anticipate with me in meeting with staff, try and anticipate what those questions are, um, and then circle back. I, you know, I, I still want to be able to proceed in a conversational um, style about this versus an applicant being an applicant. Um, because I think that it serves the community better if we're conversational than, than an applicant um, responded kind of situation, if that's cool with you guys. I, I totally agree with that, Mike. And, I, you know, sort of just to add to Rick's comments, there is also the discussion about four laning from a potential second round about north also. And those are things that are going to be very important because if they trigger something with CDOT that requires the town to spend a ton of money to four lane a highway that we don't feel needs to be four lane, we need to know that before anything is decided. And I don't know how we get, you know, I know how they are, how difficult they are to deal with and to figure out what their triggers are going to be. So um, what we don't want to do is saddle the town with a massive construction project that's doing nothing but four laning um, piece of highway that today is fine. No, I understand that. I, I, the conversations I've had about with, with the CDOT, CDOT people, I've not talked to CDOT, but the CDOT you know, experts or consultants, um, I'm not hearing that four laning is a requirement, but I'll, we'll do more investigation on that. That's a fair question to ask and have legitimately answered. And I said this, I said the other day, we were talking about the four lane roundabout at Watson in a park and it makes no sense to me to have four, a two lane, two lane roundabout into a one lane or whatever, you know what I'm saying? All right. Two one makes no sense. So, um, so we got to, we'll figure that out too, but we'll focus on 2B. We'll keep it conversational. We'll come back with some more information um, and, you know, in a couple months after we have a couple more meetings with staff um before we get to a, a a more formal component process of going forward with this project so uh mike i'll follow we'll follow up with you and talk i i want to uh i want to talk to tim barry a little bit about this and get some feedback it's a while i understand what you're trying to do i think it's a bit of an awkward process uh, because it is different than typical and uh there's kind of a reason we have the steps in place that we do. So I'll do what you guys tell me. A little bit of awkwardness for the council too. So, um, okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks, thank Mike. Thanks, Graham. Time. Thanks, Bill. All right. Thank Please. you guys. Uh, Take care. You get dressed back up now. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right, gang. We got uh, Alta Verde design update. Maybe this one will be less awkward for you. Nothing is. I hope so. <laughs> um, let's see. I want to make sure. Hi, how Campbell. are you? Elena. Welcome. Hello. Hi, we like to keep things awkward, so I'm not sure Good. about that. Good. Hey, Chris. Chris, can you make me a co-host again, please? Yep, one second. We lost Dick. Right. Where'd he go? He's still there. He just shut his camera off for a minute. He left with Dudick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, good afternoon, <laughs> Mayor, Town Council. Um, not too long ago, we were. On a, on a webinar call with you all um, to present um, the project. And during our last presentation, we really overviewed the low income housing tax credit, the project schedule, and we, and we looked at the site plan. Um, and at that time, council supported us really integrating sustainable design principles so that we can maximize the solar access and um, get to our net zero goal for the project. And so with this feedback, um, the team has 
refined the plans, architectural and site plan. Um, and the purpose of this work session is to get the council's feedback on the initial design of Alta Verde. Um, and staff has, uh, current planning has reviewed um, our, this plan that you're gonna see today and believe that it will pass a plan analysis. So that's great news. And um, Kimball Krangel and Nate Stark from Gorman as well as um, Elena Scott from Norris Design will be presenting um, this presentation outline here which includes um, the project program, site plan, um, some cross sections and elevations, looking over materials and floor plans. And I'm just gonna start out just to remind you of the questions that were in your memo. Um, as you kind of look through this, just consider those questions and we're really looking for your feedback on these items, you know, the site plan and on-site amenities, the floor plan revisions that we had talked about, um, the building elevations and the roof lines, materials and facades, um, and parking and storage, as well as um, a potential installation of a mural. So with that, I'm gonna um, let the design team really take it away and starting with Kimball on the project program. Hello everybody, thanks again for having us. Um, it's always a pleasure to be in front of you. Thanks for your time. So we are moving right along with our Alta Verde project um, and still looking to start construction of that in the springtime. As just a reminder, this is going to be an 80 apartment home uh, project in two-story buildings serving those between 30 and 60 percent of area median income rent levels. Uh, we will park to the zoning requirements, including garage parking that will also serve as a, as a base for some of our solar photovoltaics, and then quite a few amenities within um, within the project and the site plan overall, but also within every uh, apartment home. I'm not sure who's controlling this. Oh, Nicole is, hi. <laughs> so um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Elena with Norris to talk about some of the enhancements that we've made to our site plan following some staff discussions. Um, and so Elena, if you want to take it over. Hey everybody, for the record, this is Elena Scott with Norris Design. It's good to see you all, it's been a while. Let's start with orientation on the screen. The Alta Verde site is four acres and it's part of the McCain property, as you know. Adjacent properties include Stan Miller property, which is located to the north. And this is currently a concrete batch plant, but it is zoned for residential use in the future. The Blue River and Open Space Corridor are located to the west. The town's public works and snow storage site is located to the south. And Stan Miller Drive and the new water treatment plant are to the east. And we have an access point on Stan Miller Drive that you can see there in the southeast corner of the property. So our design vision really had three main goals. The first with our site plan design was to provide optimum solar gain as the site's plan to be net zero. So that was, it's really critically important, not only to the town, but also to our team. The second is to create a great sense of community um, for our new locals that will get to live at Alta Verde through both multimodal connectivity and spaces for residents to engage with the outdoors, which is really super important right now. And um, third is that transition. This is one of the first housing um, developments in this new future neighborhood. So how we set the stage to transition from industrial uses into the more natural scenic beauty of the river. Uh, it's all important with us. So from a multimodal connectivity perspective, the Blue River Bikeway is shown in purple, there that Nicole's pointing that out. And that was contemplated with the McCain Master Plan to connect from Highway 9 to the interior of the McCain property along this future access road that will go through the McCain site. The proposed alignment will follow Stan Miller Drive along the Alta Verde East property line, which you can see on the screen. It's shown at 14 feet in width. Um, and then it would uh, curve towards the west to access the river. Um, the curve of the rec path between the Alta Verde site and the town uh, public works site serves two different purposes. One is to allow the grading to transition between the two sites. Um, as you know, this site um, must be taken up out of the floodplain as all of the McCain property is. And so we want to make sure that we're planning the grading so that it's, it looks and feels natural in the future. Second, it creates a, um, a control speed for bike bicyclists that are coming through. 
And um, it also allows for us to create a nice buffer between our site and the snow storage site. That's really important. Um, there's a couple stars on the map that I wanted to point out that are really important from a multimodal perspective. The one that's at the top right of the page, that orange star, um, as part of this effort, we're looking at where the trail would cross Stan Miller Drive to make it a safe crossing and also, um, you know, what different types of ways can we slow traffic and make it safe for people that are crossing at the trail. Um, the next star down in the center that's yellow is the future uh, free ride bus stop. So we've planned this out uh, spatially and this will work on the site um, to include that along Stan Miller in this location. And then the last star that looks like it's down in the pond, which won't necessarily be a pond in the future, is that we're considering a future park and ride um, with this property that would be located adjacent to the bike path and also serve, um, serve the broader public in this area. Um, from an amenities perspective, you can see the orange um, trails that are shown throughout the site plan connecting different gathering nodes. Um, those are identified with some of the different numbers in the legend. So if you see a one, there's a gathering space contemplated for each of the buildings. We have a garden and gather site located in between buildings one and two, indicated with the number two. We have a dog yard area at um, number three. And you can also see along the entire Stan Miller Drive that we're looking at how to create a really nice streetscape that'll protect Residents make them feel secure and also act as some carbon um, sequestration as part of our overarching goals for sustainability on this property. Um, another number that you shouldn't be aware of is number four, which is a play yard, um, which also helps to create a transition from the site down to the river. On the landscape side, we're planning all Zurich and low water use materials. There's no sod. Um, we also were really careful to think about as all the uh, photovoltaics are on roofs, um, it, it was helpful for us on the landscape side, but we are contemplating that to make sure there's no shading. Um, and also drainage is really important, and we've talked about this before. Um, and if we go to the next slide, that shows a few cross sections. Uh, we've been looking at how both the trail, the rec path on the southern boundary, will work within a 25-foot easement with the grade change that we're going to experience um, from the Alte Verde site to the south. And then also we've been working with town engineering on the north side for water conveyance so that it would be a aesthetically pleasing um, drainage swale that also transitions down to the river. Um, the last thing I would mention, I forgot to mention snow storage, but that was indicated on the plan as well and is primarily provided along the southern boundary um, and there's ample space. So um, we're excited about where um, we've come with the plan. We think it's um, going to work well both for to meet our solar goals, um, but also to create a really great neighborhood. And with that, Nate will talk about architecture. Hi all, Nate Stark, um, lead architect with Gorman and Company for Colorado. I'm super excited about this project and um, really excited to present here tonight. So. Um, to get us started off, I just wanted to kind of paint the picture of what led us to our design. Um, so one of the biggest aspects, as Elena touched on, is our solar production. We're looking at anywhere from 450 to 500 kilowatt um, array for our production on site. And we're hoping to do that through the roofs. And um, so that largely impacted our design. So from the, from the get-go, we really started looking at surrounding architecture and pulling inspirations from some of the surrounding buildings that we put on this slide. Um, looking at Moose Landing, they have a lot of low slope roof um, forms um, and also like a lot of their materiality. There is a significant amount of articulation um, setbacks in that building, um, which does come with a premium and changing out materials from one material to the next um, does also have a premium cost associated with it. Um, but as far as overall form, roof form, that's really what we were pulling inspiration from on that project. And then kind of moving more towards the direct buildings to our site, um, Breckenridge Building Center, as well as the water treatment facility, um, both have very low slope roof forms, um, as well as having large masses 
unbroken and materials. Um, and so that's, that's kind of some of the forms that we were pulling together in our conceptual design phase to um, really play up our abilities to gain solar production on this project. Um, from there, we um, engaged with a design architect. Um, I'll be the architect of record on this project, um, but we usually partner with um, local design architects and architects that um, specifically work in mountain regions is what we um, aim towards for this. So we brought on Vertical Arts who has offices in Steamboat Springs and Edwards and Denver. Um, and so they pulled together these images that you see here in front of you, um, starting with the surrounding materials, pulling from nature. We want this building to really blend in and complement its surroundings, not stand out. Um, so that's the material palette, kind of what we um, brought some of our informed decisions off of. Um, and then the next form is kind of one of our design options. We went through a few de design iterations um, and landed on some roof forms that you'll see in some of these following slides, but larger masses um, really ena enabling us to stick with large pieces of array. Um, they're, the solar system doesn't really work when you break it up a lot. Um, it just adds a lot of levels of complexity to it. Um, so that, that's kind of where we were aiming with that. And then finally, we have our exterior finished palette, bringing in elements of vertical um, siding as well as elements of horizontal siding. Um, and so with that, we can move on to the next slide which is our rendering. And this is from the pr primary, um, primary views at Stan Miller and also the second one down below is kind of where you would be looking from the water treatment facility, but it really captures the, the full breadth of that, um, that building form. Um, I think we can move on to the next one with the materials. And we wanted to define some of these materials for you. So the green, the, the sage elements that you're seeing are lap siding um, and that material coloration is kind of pulled from the surrounding um, environment. And one thing we're looking at doing is instead of your straightforward lap siding, um, looking at altering the, the spacing on that, which adds a little bit of, uh, added texture to that materiality. Um, and then the next one is a natural wood grain material that's gonna be used in accent pieces. It, it, it's shown a little bit better in the elevations that we'll walk through next. Um, but those accent pieces are right below the roof form and it helps break up um, the gray element that you see in this rendering from the roof form, um, helps add some of that level of articulation, stepping back that wall mass and then the final element would be a board and batten siding. Um, usually when you see the board and batten siding in architecture, it's kind of on a typical 16 inch center. And what we're looking to do here is space those battens closer together. Um, just adds a little bit more visual interest to the elevations. Um, and I, I think it was a, a really nice suggestion by Vertical Arts to really help some of these, these masses and break them up more. Um, in addition to those kind of altered um, finished materials, we're proposing adding sunshades and those sunshades will also be um, cladded with that natural wood tone. So that will help break those facades up as well. Um, how, how are these, um how are these materials for uh, withstanding the elements? Um, considering this is a lower AMI project, we don't want this to become a maintenance nightmare for the residents in the HOA. So what's, give us some, uh, give us a little feedback on that, if you would. Yeah, so we, we would be proposing a cementitious siding for the lap siding as well as the board and batten siding. Um, those typically have, you know, a 40 to 50 year warranty on them, Carrion. Um, 
and that's kind of what we'd be targeting. We're, we're looking at long-term goals here um, as we will be operating um, this project as well. So we don't want anything that we're going to have to come back to in four or five years and have to repaint. Um, we're not fully into the pricing of if we're able to do a factory finished um, coating, which has a longer lifetime than painting, um, but that is something that we're looking into. Very good. Um, other accent pieces would be fascias, um, trim piece, trim elements, and um, one of the other components that we like to do is our windows will be um, black frame. It, it really helps not make those windows stand out. You see a lot of um, buildings with white vinyl windows, and it just it just doesn't read very well to the art architecture. Um, so that's one other element we're proposing. And then the final element on here is just a gray TPO roofing. Um, but as you know, it will be greatly covered in photovoltaic panels. Um, we didn't have any of those represented here, but um, I think everybody's familiar with, with those, um, kind of the black with a blue tone, um, somewhat reflective value to them. Um, and we really want to showcase that in our early meetings and our design charrettes. We kind of ask the question, there's, there's a couple ways to go about, about those is, do we want to showcase these, the PV as this is going to be a net zero and be, you know, a showcase project um, for the town? So that's really what we're going for is showcasing the, the solar PV panels. And next slide. Thank you. And so these next uh, few slides is just every elevation of the residential buildings. Um, all of them are within the same design um, sense as the, the main building, which is building one, which, which would be off of that primary facade or um, street. So the first one is the west elevation. And the second one is the east elevation. And as I mentioned before, you can see those lookouts at the um, roof end, which we're proposing to have a more wood, natural wood siding on those. So that would be a ton of groove um, wood siding. And on to the next one, we have our southern elevation and our northern elevation. Um, the north elevation, as you know, faces the batch plant, but we are taking into account that that is not going to be a batch plant forever. So we want to ensure that that ties in with the surrounding neighborhood um, and is attractive as well. So we, we are providing some articulation there and stepping back some of those facades. Um, and then on the southern side, it's, um, you know, in that, that same design aspect as the other ones. And we can move along to the second, second building. So this is the building in the northwest portion of the, pro, uh, the site. Um, and the, the building two and building three are um, more of a linear building with double loaded corridors. We don't have the T like we have on building one. Um, but for all intents and purposes, the same roof form, we're breaking up one, two large shed roofs, and then the rest will be a flat roof, um, quarter inch per foot, um, with a parapet uh, to screen some of the racking systems that are tied to the uh, solar system to, to screen some of those racking systems, but some of those PV panels will be sticking above that parapet. Um, and it will screen any other mechanical systems as well. And this is just the other two elevations here to give you full context of that building. And then we can move along to the next one. And the same thing here, except it gives a, a little bit of a different feel as our shed roofs are facing the south to gain um, the solar 
um, aspect on those. Um, so it just has a little bit different of a feel. Um, so that eastern elevation will be what you primarily see as you enter our site. Um, and then the next slide. And we have our north elevation, which would be seen from the playground area as well as the west elevation, which will be seen by everybody taking advantage of the amazing Blue River to the west of us. And next, this slide is an aerial view showing the roof forms to host all of our um, solar panels. And then it also shows um, context for some um, view shed images that we have on the following slides. So um, the following slides will be to show the context of the proposed structure um, within the existing um, surrounding. So this one's from the roundabout looking at the site. So as you can see, it will be greatly screened by the water treatment facility um, and, and sitting nicely behind it. And the next one. From here, we're actually showing um, an elevation on the water tower associated with the water treatment facility um, and showing that that, that, oh, that height is almost greater than most aspects of our building site. And again, with that water tower measurement for reference, um, and then we do have a uh, dimension as well on the um, foremost element of the building one, which is somewhere around 35 feet. And then for our overall floor plan, I just wanted to show this to cover some of the building amenities that we're, sh we're pro pro proposing, excuse me. Um, all of those will be hosted for the most part in the building one. We'll have a common space right there in the middle um, with leasing, um, a large indoor bike storage facility, a fitness area, and a community room um, as part of that big yellow block. It might be hard to read at this scale. Um, and then we have double loaded corridors with a good diversity of units kind of spread throughout all of the buildings. So we don't, we're not lumping all, all of our two bedrooms into one building or anything like that. So there's a nice um, variation of, of building layout or a unit layout in those. Um, these will be two story and we will not have an elevator for them. So we are proposing that we have all of our accessibility units covered on first floor for um, accessible access. Um, so we will have five type A units and then all of the first floor building um, units will be type B. Um, if anybody is super familiar with the IBC and ANSI codes. Next slide. For the unit plans, um, we loved the suggestion that we got um, from town council on the last go around as far as having a formal entryway. So um, it was really good to get that integrated into here. Um, we have these benches right off of the entry um, that will serve to have residents come in, take their boots off. We're, we're, we just issued our um, schematic design set for some pricing and we're, we're looking at having a nice little bench with some cubbies underneath for stashing away boots and other personal items as you walk into your home. Um, and then we also have these large Colorado closets is like what we like to call them um, that will host our domestic water heater um, as well as everything else that you could store in there, which these are, are very nicely sized, um, appropriate to the amount of bedrooms per unit. Um, the kitchens and living rooms are laying out really nicely as far as giving some good space for um, the kitchen, living room with a area for a small little dining table and some of those we don't have our 
furniture fully placed in there, but um, our our bedrooms are pretty nicely sized um, as far as historical projects we've worked on. So the, the, these are laying out really nicely um, at this level of our design process. So um, I foresee some minor tweaks to make these unit layouts a little more efficient, but um, I think they're looking really good as far as livability. Um, next slide. Um, one of the things that came up is we, we do a lot of murals on our projects and um, we wanted to pr provide some examples of previous projects that we've done murals on. Um, we really haven't um, flagged an area that we want to do a mural on on the project, but we just wanted to gauge council's interest in the concept of having a mural on the project. We, um, we really like to bring in a community artist that ties that mural in with, um, with local history and, and things like that. Um, it just adds a level of vibrancy and a sense of place um, that just, uh, just really adds, adds to the project. So, and that is the end of my presentation. Sorry, I wanted to scramble through everything um, so I don't take everybody's time up, um, but I'm open to questions here. Thanks, Nate. Um, so um, this is really the time where we kind of have ended our presentation and we're hoping for council's discussion to kind of center around these questions and of course, provide any other design feedback um, that you guys have for us. So um, please take it away. Hey, I'm, I'm kind of confused on the water heater storage. Is that, is that a a water heater and storage in one closet, uh, Nathan, Nathaniel? Yes, sir. It is. So do you, I mean, is it, are there shelves? Do you, do you put stuff on the water heater? I mean, is that, is that uh, safe fire-wise? Looks like a pretty... <laughs> it, yeah, they're gonna be electric water heaters um, and even even if it is a gas combustion water heater, it's it's safe to have storage items in. And there, uh, one of the big concerns is more on electrical panels and keeping clear floor space in front of those. Yeah. Um, but we'll have drain pans and an indirect drain into a floor drain underneath those water heaters. So if there is an overflow issue, that that is mitigated easily to a floor drain. Um, in, a, in a nutshell, so other you, things that, you've done this before, and you're confident that it will work. Yes, Jeffrey. Cool. Thanks, man. Hey, Eric, Eric, for the sake of time, I think instead of going through each of these questions, I, maybe you just ask any of the council members if if they have any concerns uh, or would want to look at any changes relative to what they've seen so far. Yeah. Do you guys hear that? Who wants to go first? Kelly? I, I would be happy to go first. Um, I love the floor plan change with the entry in the mudroom. That's just fantastic and will make a big quality of life for those people. I also am excited about the park and ride. That was very, very cool. I hadn't heard it before. I was curious um, if the trash and recycle area had enough room for a compost. If we could do composting out there, I think that would be great and really in line with um, our values. Um, I just would caution you with the gathering space, the Wellington gathering space is significantly underused. So I know that you guys are professionals and I'm sure that you'll do the right thing, but um, please maybe look around the county for things that have been really successful because our Wellington one really hasn't been. I was curious if you guys um, thought about porches at all. And um, the, I love the black. I think it's really cool looking, but dark colors in the sun up here require an, a, like an intense amount of upkeep. So I would caution you against that. And I'm not really into the mural idea. If it was something very natural that didn't really stand out, maybe you could talk me into it. But the, um, the ones that you showed probably, I don't think really would fit with um, our priorities. Well, and the ones, just to um, clarify that, the ones that we showed, 
every mural that we do is very neighborhood specific and absolutely representative representative of the place that that building lives. So here we would look at something quite different than the examples that we showed. We just wanted to show that um, murals can fit and they wear pretty well over time. So those were those were why we showed those examples. Okay, thanks for that. I'm not saying I wouldn't consider it, but I would, um, I would want something more natural on the natural side for sure. Hey, thanks, Kelly. Dick, I, um, I like, I like it. Generally, I like it a lot. I, um, I would still like to see a covered uh, bike storage with, um, with electric charging opportunities for e-bikes. Because I, I think we'll see a lot of bicycle commuting during the summer um, from this. Um, yeah, probably with Kelly with the mural, I, I, I could probably be persuaded. I feel like murals are, I don't know, they, they, this to me is, is such a beautiful setting by the river and back in there. Right now it feels a little bit industrial, but I think um, as the batch plant goes away and and um, you know the water water treatment plant is landscaped and finished. It's it's going to be a pretty you know pretty nice site. So I, I'm probably with Kelly. Just be very sensitive to what you propose as a mural. Those are my comments. Thanks, Dick. Aaron. Um, I'm just looking at the pictures again. Sorry. I um, I think it looks great. I think. Uh, let's see here. I support the site layout, the pedestrian path connections. I'll be interested to see what um, what that premium pedestrian path will look like. Um, but I think it looks it looks safe. Um, I love the the how the bike path goes by it. Um, I think the floor plans look fantastic. Um, I think that was a really great upgrade. Um, Yes, I support the flat shed roof lines to maximize solar access. I think that's great. Um, and yes, I, I support and I support the rest of it too. Um, and as far as the mural goes, yeah, I, I guess I agree with Dick and, um, and Kelly. I guess it depends on what it looks like. You know, I have set social equity on the, on the mind, so it could be pretty cool to have um, to have a mural done by um, somebody from our Hispanic community or something like that to diversify the art in our communities. But um, again, I, I'd have to, it's hard to, to visualize it considering that's not normally what we do. Um, something else, we're convinced. So I see that there's a playground, which I think is great. Um, but we're, and we're convinced that kids will live here, right? I mean, is, there, is that ever a question with some of these projects or is that just understood? We oftentimes see lots of kids at our properties. Okay, okay. Just, just to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to see all these amenities utilized um, as well as the community gardens. I think that's great. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Jeffrey. Um, I like the floor plan. I like the change of the floor plan, the mudroom and all that, all that. Um, the flat roof, I'm, I'm into it. If you guys can pull it off, uh, you know, you know what, uh, you, we're living in the land of the chosen frozen. So if you can, if you can pull the flat roof off without any sort of water issues and, and enough to, uh, keep the photovoltaic, uh, exposed, that's cool. Um, I like how the pedestrian path through. The compost would be, you know, that'd be kind of nice to have, but you know that thing has to be empty, uh, kind of dependent on the use. You can't let compost go too far. I like the murals and, uh, you know, depending on what goes up there, you know, I'd give it a try. So I'm a little bit more, uh, a little bit more artsy than these uh, three guys before me. You really are. Dennis? Uh, I love... I love the Colorado closet. That was a great, that's perfect for storage as you walk into your home. I do have a question on building number one. Is that the only building that has indoor bike storage or is it gonna be in two and three as well? Currently it's the only one. Um, 
it's about 260 square feet currently. Um, and I do like the suggestion of adding some power chargers to that for the e-bike charging station. So we'll definitely take that into consideration. Um, we, we haven't gone way overboard with that as we have those Colorado closets for in unit storage of bikes. Um, one of the other things that we do is put a wall rack in those storage units so you can store your bike um, pretty effectively without taking up too much floor space in there. Okay. So between that, that and site, site racks. Yep. Thank, thank you. The only other question I have on the site plan is on your trash enclosures. So it looks like we have three trash enclosures, but the biggest building being building number one, we only have one trash enclosure close to that. And I don't know if there's an opportunity there for that to be enlarged. But outside of that, I like the project and I am with the rest of those Jumonks. I am not sold on the mural idea. Sorry. Thanks, Dennis. Gary? Yeah, uh, for me, a strong green light for the project. I'm very pleased to see the revisions that were made based upon uh, council's comments uh, previously. And I am definitely not a mural guy to start putting murals on our buildings. Hmm. This is a property that uh, seems to be, we're emphasizing trying to make it fit into the uh, sort of that open space environment out there and looking up onto the hills. And for me, I, I don't think there's any type of a mural that I would ever uh, probably go along with, but it won't matter because when that decision is made, I won't be here. How about if it's a view riding your mountain bike? <laughs> and we have a great water tank. We have a big water tank. <laughs> we we'll call yeah. it the Gallagher tank. Yeah, we're not going to let you go, Gary. Uh, I, I love everything. You know, the, the, uh, one of the worries about doing a, a lower AMI project is that it's going to look like a lower AMI project. And I think this doesn't look that way. I think it's got, got a great look. I think uh, making sure that we um, have this as maintenance free as possible. And I, I know that's important to you, Kimball, as the, you know, as the management team also, but uh, what we don't want to do is saddle people with, you know, additional dues for that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I think spending a little extra money to get the factory finish on the, on the exterior, I think is well worth it. If, you know, if, if you can make that pencil, everything else is great. I'd like the mural idea. I thought that was pretty cool. Maybe in, in interior courtyard mural. So it's uh more about the residents and uh, you know, I, I like those ones that you showed, those would not be appropriate for up here, but you know, something that's mountainy, I would support, but that's only Artie, Jeffrey and, and myself. So I, I guess, I guess you lose that, that battle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you got something to add? Yeah, one thing to add real quick, Eric, is the mail room. Would it make sense with 80 units to have some, some provision so people don't have to drive to town to get their mail? Is that allowed? Did the, the post office allow that? Yes. Why don't we put those everywhere in town? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did check with that early on because on, on our project in Keystone, they do not make deliveries there. So we had to set up PO boxes for 196 units. Um, so we do have a bank of mailboxes within that community area and building one. So you do in this project, or it? Correct. Oh, that's great. Well, awesome. Well done. Cool. Yeah. All right. I could redesign our neighborhood. Get some mailboxes. Um, anything else, anyone? Hey, Eric, the only thing I'll throw out real quick because I think this is really exciting opportunity for the town. You know, we we received our eight hundred thousand dollar grant to implement a shared bike program in this town. That's a lot of money. That's going to help us design by product, everything on where the best location. And, and I think we'll want to work with, you know, looking at that, but they, it could be a great location for a rack out here of, of shared e-bikes because, you know, um, in one of these gathering areas, it maybe could be reprogrammed for that. Because as you stated in the summer, I could really see people coming and going from there, you know, by using one of those uh, shared e-bikes. So yeah. we're pretty excited uh, 
and trying to identify those key locations in town where those uh, kiosk type e-bike things would work best and how we move forward with making that whole grant thing successful. So that's great. That's a great idea because those e-bikes are pretty expensive. So I think having the shared program out there is an awesome solution. Yeah. All right, Kimball, thank you. Uh, Nathaniel, thank you. And Nicole, looks like you've already left. Thank you. No, I'm here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thanks. Great job, great job, gang. Well, thank you guys. And, and we will be integrating your comments into our final um, application for the development permit. We really appreciate your time. Super exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank uh, you all. Updates. Tim? Uh, Julia. Julia. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Um, as you all are aware, the um, Federal Communication Commission, the FCC, in the state of Colorado passed regulations regarding small cell deployments in the municipal right of ways. Um, those regulations limit some of the government um, authority in an effort to make 5G readily available nationwide. Um, in compliance with the FCC guidelines, the um, town council adopted the small cell design guidelines in 2019. Um, and subsequently to that, we have um, then decided to research what would be the best small cell deployment plan um, for the town's best interest in relation to aesthetic concerns and um, just the potential clutter of small cell poles in the rights of way in town. To do that, we issued an RFI, a request for information and we um, reviewed several responses and chose to um, move forward in discussions with American Tower Company, as well as uh, with a partnership with Newcom. And we've been before you a few times, so that's just sort of an intro for the public that's on the call as well. Um, but before we move forward with negotiations with American Tower, um, we have had some recurring um, questions that have come up that we'd like to run by the town council for some direction. So as we go into contract negotiations and revisions to the town small cell design guidelines, um, we wanted to get these key issues addressed uh, by the council. So the American Tower contract uh, does have a benefit to providers, we believe, by having American Tower would be installing the fiber to the poles. Fiber is required to run 4G and um, 5G, as well as get their entitlements. And then the providers, in theory, would be signing on to these American Tower poles in the rights of way. There's no cost to the town with this contract. And a, American Tower would not implement any of this until they had at least one major provider signed on um, for installation. Um, I want to note that we are not uh, legally able to require providers to sign on to the American Tower um, contract. So that would be um, a negotiation between American Tower and the, the providers. If the providers did not want to go with American Tower, then they could proceed on their own through our small cell design guidelines and entitlement process. So I wanted to outline a couple of pros and cons of some of the items we've run into. The administrative waiver um, is something that you see in the current small cell design guidelines. And um, at the advice of our town telecommunication attorney, Kim Feldman, um, we would recommend that this administrative waiver remain in place. And then what the administrator wa administrative waiver does is um, if the providers wouldn't be able to meet our, some of our small cell design guidelines, they could apply for this waiver um, and prove that they wouldn't be able to meet those gui a specific guidelines, for example, height um, or co-location. Um, 
Mr. Fellman also recommended that the town hire a third party uh, radio frequency RF engineer to review any administrative waiver proposals as well. So we would be proposing that um, in addition. I wanna mention that April 28th, we were before the town council and um, as it relates to small cell design guidelines, we would still be implement, recommending implementation and changes to those guidelines based on, um, for example, the issues that didn't have any um, major concerns from the providers. We had a order of preference, which we have currently in the small cell design guidelines and the council really um, wanted to see the preference go toward town owned buildings and private buildings, for example, versus in the rights of way. So we would still be proceeding that way. Um, but for those that do apply to the right of way, um, these would be in effect as well. So co-location um, is really the placement of more than one carrier on a single pole. Um, one of those benefits is that, you know, if you in theory have less um, or two providers on a pole, you're gonna have less poles um, perforate through town rights of ways. Um, it's pr problematic to the carriers, um, we've been told because of the unlicensed spectrum frequencies that they use and the interference that they can have between each other. Um, so that is one of the concerns that they have. Um, so that would be a potential uh, administrative waiver, for example, if co-location were required. Um, right now it's recommended in our current design standards. And we like to know would the council like to keep that recommended or not. The American Tower Poll is one of the new poles that allow for co-location. Um, they do say that um, two providers can locate on their pole. Um, it is one of the first ones developed to our knowledge and on the market. Um, experts also have told us that as time progresses, co-location is gonna look more feasible and there'll be more pole manufacturers um, creating co-location um, feasible poles. But just to note that we are receiving pushback from providers on the co-location requirement proposal. Uh, with regard to height, um, currently in our standards, we have a 40 foot height requirement for non-residential areas, um, requirement meaning a maximum, and a 30 foot tall pole maximum in residential areas in the conservation district. The American Tower um, proposal, um, proposed pole is 20 feet in height. Um, just for some reference, the typical Wellsbach um, light fixture poles that we see in town, um, specifically in the historic district and residential areas are around 15 feet in height. Um, we have heard from Verizon that they are um, acceptable. They find that 25 feet are, is acceptable um, for a height. So um, we have not necessarily heard the same from um, AT&T. So one of the benefits is the lower the height is less visually intrusive into in the town um, and more in conformance with our existing light fixtures that we have in the rights of way. Um, one of the potential downfalls of it is the lower height that you have, um, the potential for more poles to perforate throughout the rights of way. Now, um, we could put in some kind of separation, for example, in our proposed standards, we had um, the intersections in the historic district as recommended um, locations, and that is what the American Tower proposal has as well. So what that would leave is, you know, really putting the preference toward building locations if there's a need for something mid-block, for example, unless they went through this administrative waiver process. And the last piece, um, it brings me to the term length and um, our master license agreement that's approved right now is a term length of 20 years. 
Um, and American Tower has also proposed a 20-year license term, a uh, 10-year original term with a 10-year extension possibility. So there's some um, questions for you all on co-location height and term, term length of the agreement. And um, we'll proceed forward with based on your feedback. Okay, questions? Yeah, I just wanted to make... Yeah, go ahead, Gary. I just want to mention that uh, our telecommunications uh, attorney, Mr. Feldman, also suggested that uh, you know, typically what they're seeing in the industry is perhaps up to a 10-year term, and any extension would be uh, when both parties were, were in agreement, as opposed to an automatic 10-year to go out 20 years. I know that's something that I I'm going to... I'm asking now that uh, that's one of the things that I think uh, I would like to see. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Gary, I was gonna, Gary, I was gonna take that off the table. I think based on what we heard from Ken Feldman, there's a couple of these that are no brainers, obviously. And I think we need to go in and negotiate a lower contract for that agreement uh, with them based on what we heard from Ken. And, uh, you know, the administrative waiver is a process, right? It's a process that we need to have in place and then we need to figure out how we're gonna utilize a third party uh, engineer to review uh, a waiver that's done. Uh, I mean, my recommendation to the council is, I think all of the goal of all of us is to try to keep the height of the poles as low as reasonably, and I think the key word is reasonably possible. And I really think we should look to Ken I mean, Ken said that he wanted to follow up with Tim. He's got a few things he wants to address in there. But if, if Ken thinks, um, you know, probably don't do 20 because it's not reasonable, but maybe have 25 as your height. And then if anybody tries to go over that, they've got to do the waiver application and we go through that process, then I think that's what, you know, we ought to throw in there is that based on, I mean, he lives this stuff every day. And even the co-location one is an interesting dilemma and I'm not sure how we would feel about that because maybe it does force us to have bigger poles with more stuff on them to be co-located. And I, um, so, and he said, don't require them, but yeah, recommend he's... them. So why, I, don't, I mean, I don't think we're going to go against his recommendations and, you know, and, I think so if we're in agreement, we would say that we would recommend co-location. And I think we, I, isn't it everybody's preference to keep the height to a minimum, right? So yes. we get with him and say, what's that reasonable height we should design in our design guidelines and, uh, and, and insert that in there. And then we bring it back to you guys for this new adoption based I mean, he's good and he, he should help us finish writing this stuff up and then we bring it back to you. I think he knows what we want to accomplish. Julia knows what we want to accomplish and um, I think we can get there now. Yeah, Rick, I, I think letting him finish this thing first is really the way to go. I mean, I none of us can really tell you what the correct length of time with American Tower is. He can, I can. I'm, 20 years doesn't sound that long to me. We, you know. But um, I, I think he should just tell us what he thinks we can get, what he thinks we can get from these guys that have the full support of the FCC. And that's yeah. the problem. I mean, I would rather tell them, these are the rules, the hell with you, but that's obviously not gonna happen. So is everybody okay with letting Ken polish yeah. up these, you know, our guidelines and, and do it this way? Sure. Absolutely, and I think we have nothing to fear about having an administrative waiver process in place. And because I think it hasn't really been tested sufficiently, and I don't think that we should be shy and say, hey, we have to have a, a process in place, and we've got to bring somebody in, and we've got to sit across the table. Um, that doesn't concern me at all, because I think so much new ground is being broken uh, that I think we write in what it is that we want. If we have to discuss a waiver, we discuss the waiver and depending upon that outcome, who knows where that may go. I think things are gonna change fast too, Gary, so. <clears throat> All right.
I'm in full agreement with Rick. All right. Hey, Tim, okay. are you good with that recommendation? Absolutely. All right. uh, I will uh, contact Julia and I will set up a meeting with Mr. Feldman as quickly as we can. One thing I want to explain to the council, we have what Ken referred to as a master license agreement form, uh, which is sort of a contract between the town and the carriers uh, setting up rules for the deployment of small cells in the town's right of way. The one that we're working off of is basically based on the Summit County model that coincidentally Fellman's office wrote. Um, so, you know, the, a the ATC contract that they proposed really, I think, needs to be turned into a master license agreement using our standard form. Um, it, originally, I thought that ATC was going to do more for the town uh, as far as consulting and advising. It sounds, the more I hear this, it sounds like they're simply another poll provider. And uh, if that's the case, then I would, it'll, it'll take a day or two to change forms and they may not like it, but I'd like to have the same basic agreement with ATC that we have or will have with Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile. Or, or another, or, you know, they don't have exclusivity either. And so as Ken said, right. you know, Crown Council may come in and say, yeah. you know, I've got, I, I'm working with Verizon and I want to do this. And so I yeah. think we have to be open to that. Yeah, yeah we absolutely. Have All right, everybody good on this? All right. Julia, thanks, Ken. Uh, Tim. Ken. Not here. We need to take a quick five minute break. Um, oh God. Super quick bathroom break. Super five Everybody mute. When do we have to be back by? Five minutes, Jeffrey. Okay, I didn't hear. I, oh, 6 30. Okay, I got you. All right, I'm going to mute myself. I'm muted. That's the Try to get through a couple of uh, agenda topics. Uh, I know there's a couple of things we just wanted to brief the council on with regards to Wackwell Main Street update. We wanted to start having a conversation with uh, businesses out there. Actually, we'll start with our kind of our recovery committee is now called our resiliency committee, and um, you know. At some point, we need to start talking about when's you know when is the closure going to open back up again, and we're looking at the ability to extend that into uh, farther into September if need be, if the weather allows. But I think just as important, if not more, right now is we w we want to start hearing from people about what ideas they may have for uh, winter. winter as we get into late fall and winter, is there something that they've been looking at or thinking about with regards to their property where they may want to try to capture some outdoor space with a heated tent or do something just a little differently? Um, and we kind of have to start thinking about what might we as a town be willing to do in the winter? But we don't know that until we start hearing some of the ideas that people may have. Um, there, you know, if I'll give you an example, a, a ski shop that normally has a very small parking lot in front of their building said, hey, we might want to look at putting a kind of a, a tent enclosure over uh, kind of that not so good parking area so that we could social distance and capture people in a in a tenant area before they come into the building to help help do that. Um, yeah, so I mean, we don't even know that they're thinking about that unless they talk to us um, and give us a thought of what, what they're thinking about. And so one of the things we wanna start having a conversation, uh, possibly as early tomorrow with the resiliency committee is how do we, how do we go out and communicate to our businesses um, and ask for feedback from them on what they may be looking at or thinking about with regards to winter. I think it's all of us sitting here, it's safe to assume that 
things won't be normal as we start winter. And so, you know, what, what do we need to start thinking about now so we're not scrambling at the last minute? I think like we tried to, you know, we had to do for uh, summer to get open. And so we want to have that communication, start having it. We didn't want any of you to be surprised uh, if you started hearing about us, you know, kind of reaching out and, and seeking that feedback from different businesses and uh, do any of you have any concerns relative to us starting to to uh, ask those questions? Rick, you know a piece that might make sense going in would be to under get, get some help from the building department and maybe red, white, and blue to help us understand uh, parameters around tents during the winter. You know, I, oh, I've heard of a few folks who are interested in putting tents on their own property and just from a structural standpoint what sure, you know, what, what's there. required there what can we allow yeah. I, I think that we need as a group to really start thinking worst case scenario for the fall and the winter i don't think i don't think that is as far-fetched as it seemed when things were start we were starting to come out of things and things seemed good I think we all need to really start thinking about what happens if Polis decides on an, an indoor ban like they're starting to do in other states because things are getting out of hand. You know, Colorado's starting to track upwards. We're not in Summit County, but Colorado is. Polis could pull the plug on everybody instantly. We need to, we need to have some real ideas about how we're going to jump this, you know, quickly. I mean, are we going to cut loose another million dollars? Do we have another million dollars for rent relief? If we get to that point, um, what, what what are we going to do? What where are we going to go with this? Because this is, I think this is more likely going to be the reality that come the winter. We're not any we're, we're either not any farther along than we are today, and we don't have the street open, so there'll be a lot of businesses that have considerably less area to do business in for the winter time or there's a big shutdown coming. And how are we going to handle that as a council? And we cannot be surprised if either of those things happen. So I'm not saying we talk about that tonight, but we need to all start thinking about what are we going to be willing to do as a town to try to save the businesses that are here? Because we will have to do something. I completely agree. I think that the more that we think about this, the better, the more that we start looking at ideas um outside spread people out all of that you know I, is it just a question can we close main street and i'm sorry if this has come up before main street during the winter or are, how long how long or may, maybe i should change the question how long do we have to open how long do we have to open main street during the fall well i yeah. think i think the real question is are we okay expanding what we're doing right now into September. I think after September, the weather gets too dicey. I mean, there are great weekends, there are great days, but I think in general, the weather gets too dicey. You know, first of all, we haven't even talked about anybody to anybody really yet. We need to talk to the business community because you know there are businesses that are against what we're currently doing. Not as many as there were originally, but there are still businesses that do not like what we're doing. We want to we want to honor, you know, their feelings and what they feel they've been going through. Just so everybody understands, even a business like mine that has a successful frontage on Main Street right now, we're still only at 60% of what we normally would do in July. So while that is a great help, nobody is doing what they would be doing. Um, so that's, I think that's an important piece for for you as the council to understand, there's nobody that has been made whole by what we have done with this walkable area. It is considerably better, but no one is whole. And I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that is even a feasible model to try to even think about tending it and closing Main Street. Oh, I, I would not, I wouldn't support, I, I think it's too cold, Rick. I just- I, I, I think would, it's too cold, it's too icy. Uh, trying to deliver food, everything would be a nightmare. I don't think you could hey, do it. Well, we need I personally, yeah, I, 
think the businesses are going to need access to their curbside because if we get shut down, which I agree, Eric is a is a is a strong possibility. Businesses can survive with with delivery and and pick up of both retail and restaurant, and that might be a question to ask the group, Eric, in your meeting is to get the collective heads together and how could we accentuate that kind of commerce for both retail and restaurant, for, you for, know, the takeout model, the curbside model, the, uh, you know, the, the, the remote type um, sales model. Um, yeah. To have some spaces per block where there could be, you know, delivery to cars, pick up to cars for, for businesses that don't currently have that kind of thing, I think would be important. The, the other side of this coin is not just, the businesses that are going to be suffering, we're going to have people come here and really not have a great time because they will not be able to get in anywhere. So we yeah. need to, you know, we need to get together with the BTO so that people understand, look, you, you need to do a couple days of carry out food. It's just going to be part of the equation. If you're coming on vacation now, um, you're going to need to, you're going to need to be okay with calling retail and getting retail over the phone. If, if we get to that model and, and maybe we won't get there and maybe I'm totally wrong and I, God hope I am wrong, but. I don't know. I hope you're wrong too, but I, I do think we have to be prepared. And, and I would like to put the word out to, to the business owners that we, you know, will cast, cast regulations to the wind to a certain degree, as long as we can maintain public safety. I think we have to be incredibly flexible to, to do what we have to do to keep what businesses we have afloat in the worst case scenario. If it's, if it's the best case scenario, then all well and good. But I do think that we, you know, we, we have to be ready for the worst and hope for the best. That might also include, um, I, and I honestly don't know, I, I haven't used any, but delivery services as well, perhaps. That might be a bigger thing in the winter. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot of conversation to have we mainly want you to have a heads up that we want to start that conversation now um, so that you uh, you have an awareness, okay? And you know, as, as we look at, are we going to stay open and keep Maine walkable through September? I would really like to have some hard facts if businesses actually think this was a success. And do they want to see us stay open through September? Because I think we told them the middle of August, didn't we, Rick? Yeah, we did. Well, we always, yeah, that was what we threw out there originally. And, I, and the feedback, I mean, they could, BTO could tell you right now the ones they've been reaching out to, the ones, I think the, the key is going to be the ones in the area are going to tell right. you, yes, it's been very successful. The ones outside of it, maybe not so much. So we're, you know, we're going to look at some sort of a, uh, you know, a quick little instrument we can put out there to kind of get some feedback from people so that we're sensitive to not only those inside, but those out, outside the area, so. I wonder if there's a way to tell how much people are down because of COVID, because people's behaviors have changed and because, you know, you can only have so many people in the restaurant. Like there's so many things, there's so many factors that closing down Main Street has affected versus, where would we be if we didn't close out, close down Main Street during COVID? Yeah. I don't know that we can ever measure that, but that would be an interesting metric to look at. All right, anything else on the update? So the other thing we want to get some direction from the council on is uh, a process for filling the vacancy, council vacancy that will be occur uh, after the second meeting in July. So as of uh, basically July 28th will be Gary's last meeting and then we have, uh, or you have 60 days to appoint a replacement uh, to do that. Um, just as a reminder, what we've typically done, uh, we did this when Dick was appointed, we did it when Kelly was appointed, is we sent out um, and asked for letters of interest from people that wanted to be considered uh, for that appointment. Um, 
I, you know, whether or not you hold interviews is totally up to you. Depending, typically, I mean, in Dick's situation, we didn't interview. We just voted. In Kelly's, we did. So I, if you're looking at past precedent, um, you know, you've got one of each. And I think it's, a lot of that is going to be dependent upon how many how many people put in for it because it could be, uh, you know, it's going to have to be in a Zoom setting and it could be very cumbersome to, to interview 10 to 15 people. So, uh, you know, if we do get that many, we can always come back and check in with you on a process. We can look for a way to, to whittle that down a little bit if you did want to interview uh, a group of finalists or however you want to define that. So I think, you know, probably the the most important question now would be, you know, do you want to follow the same process we've used recently? Well, as far as I can remember, anytime we've had it, and uh, and do letters of interest. And if so, then we would certainly get post those and have those put out for at least a, probably a couple week period to allow people an opportunity to put in for it. Questions? Well, I just think to clarify, when I applied, we it was like down to some finalists. And I think the interview is important to be able to talk to people. So I think that would be my point. Yeah, Kelly. If we get 25 people, though, I think we need to whittle it down before we do that. Well, that's what it was like for when, when we went through mine. It was whittled down to either the final four or something like that. Was it? I couldn't remember. Oh, yeah. Why did yeah. Gary just appoint somebody? <laughs> I think it was uh, my I think with, account number. I think with Kelly, it got whittled down to five. And with me, I, as I recall, you guys strongly encouraged us to reach out to the council people and talk to them. Yeah. So. But it's going to be a lot different now because in the old days, you could reach out and talk to somebody. Right. Now it's, it's, you know, you, you, you have to do a phone call or you have to, I mean, it's just harder to meet at a coffee shop or, or whatever. You have to, I don't want people to know where I live. <laughs> what would the voting look like? Uh, it would be on Zoom. It'd be very, um, we'd have to figure it out, but it'd be pretty transparent, that's for sure, because you'd have to, I mean, you're going to be sitting there and we're sitting here and. I'm sure we could do it by email, though, too. Definitely a letter of intent. And then we see who's interested. How does everybody feel about that? Good. Does Gary vote as well? Uh, no. Gary won't be on by the time you are making those oh. selections. Okay. I mean, I'm because I would imagine that Depending on when we put it out, they probably would have, close, you know, probably close to the end of July to submit their letter. And then we would, uh, you know, we got the first part of August. So, and we're not going to do, we're going to try to keep August 11th really light. So we're not doing anything there. Uh, there's a good chance we know at least one, maybe two council people will be gone and Gary will be off. So that's only going to leave uh, potentially four people. So uh, the earliest you would even consider, you know, if we interview in that would be the second meeting in August. Um, but we have until the second meeting in September to make the appointment. I believe it's September 22nd or something like that. So um, we, we have flexibility in how we go about doing it. And once we, you know, see what the numbers are to put in and talk about it, so. To pass an emergency ordinance, we need five votes. Is that right? Correct. Okay. I was ready to support the um, fourth highest vote getter, but I can see that I'm not in the majority. So I am um, I'm supportive of what we discussed. Hey, uh, Tim, do, do for you need a super majority? If, even if there's only six council members, would it still be five? Uh, I'm looking right now at the charter. I didn't remember there to be a supermajority, but give me 60 seconds. Yeah, okay. 
I'm talking about if we did an emergency ordinance when there's only in the future when there that was Aaron's question. Yeah. If oh. we do another emergency ordinance. Yeah. It, with yes. only six. You still, then you still got to have five. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you have any idea when we'll meet in uh, again in person, Rick? Do you get a sense of that? No. Uh, yeah. Am I, you know what? I just don't think we should rush it. I think yeah, it will. Yeah. I think. Uh, I think the fact that we have to be open and and you know the community provide community input. You know, it's it's one thing to control six or seven of you in a setting, but it's another thing to try to control. Uh, you know, the community that can't, has a right to show up, and how they can still participate and see everything. And so. Okay. And this way, Jeffrey, you do not have to wear pants. Yeah, it's, it's been very, very Benefit. refreshing. All right. Uh, anything else? Uh, we got 10 minutes. You wanna... So where do we land? We're doing letters of interest. Is that what everybody wanted? Majority wanted? And then we'll... That'd be my vote. Letters of interest, then we'll figure out, you know, how many we got and yeah. go from there. All right, you guys uh, want 10 minutes? What do we, we get, 10, 10 minutes? You want 10, 10 minute minutes? break or you could do a committee report or something? Do committee reports. Anybody? Committee reports, let's keep rolling. Well, we had a, a housing in child care. What, what are we on, Dick? Housing. We had a housing, uh, housing. <laughs> a housing uh, uh, meeting today, and, and for some reason, I mean, it was people said it was it was the best ever. Um, uh, this this last one, and we talked about uh, the proposal or one of the one of the possibilities for a, uh, a parcel by by the rec center, uh, and uh, the David O'Neill and his group put out something uh, it was kind of interesting about kind of about I think it was eighteen really micro units and what would have to do with that. And it was, it was uh, yeah, very, very interesting knowing, seeing what we could possibly do or he could possibly do or we could possibly do or another developer could do with these small units and how to most, most uh, best take advantage of a limited space. Did I get that about right, Dick? Pretty good, Jeffrey. Yeah. Pretty right. good. Yeah. Did we we talked about that. We did a, a report on housing helps. Um, the county mm -hmm. is getting ready to run out of money. They're kind of reaching out to the other basins to see if they're going to do something before they'll come back to us, I think. We talked buy downs. Um, so we jump in. What am I, what are we forgetting here? You guys are, you guys are off course a little bit. <laughs> oh yeah. Why? Well, we do housing and child care as part of the work session up there. Oh. So, but oh, okay. the report of the report of mayor and council members are our, are the list of things that I was going to let them finish. And <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> this has been very. I'm just trying to get us back on track here. Okay, thanks. Sorry about I that. I just wanted to listen to them report out on child care. <laughs> I was just waiting for yeah, that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting yeah. me hang myself. Open space. Give it a go for you, Kelly. Open space. <laughs> Open space has not met this last two weeks. Dennis, anything with tourism? Uh, you're on mute. You're I'm muted. Sorry, I see Lucy's on. I think she could update us better than I could. I yeah. wasn't at the meeting. We can wait for her. Uh, Heritage. Dennis, nothing. you have here? nothing. Okay. Um, there was nothing with water. Plants getting close though. Uh, creative arts, Mr. Gallagher, two more times. Yeah, just, uh, you know, real quickly, uh, I think most of us have seen what the BCA and the other resident arts, or arts organizations have been doing around town. So they've been very active. Uh, BCA has scheduled a bunch of uh, things over 4th of July. The other resident arts organizations have been doing things uh, up in between the Riverwalk Center and the, uh, the Arts District. The coordination now with the solidarity 
a mural that will uh, be, you know, be moved along with you know, the council's comments uh, already in. Uh, Matt will be moving forward with the artist. He gets this done by Sunday. And the other thing is just at a very high level, not to go into any detail, is that uh, you know, BCA slash Breck Music, um, they really have been looking at uh, their employee personnel side. There's uh, reductions that are, have been done and some more that will be forthcoming. And some individuals have been slotted now to kind of serve a role that supports both BCA and Breck Music. So uh, the things that we were hoping for in terms of a consolidation and an merger, we're starting to see some of those benefits uh, has, as has been accelerated due to the, uh, the coronavirus. Yeah, Gary, I was gonna say, I've just been working, you know, in a group with Matt on the reopening committee or the Main Street committee, and he is such a terrific um, addition to our community. He is just so eager to jump right in and help and he has lots of great ideas. It's been a real pleasure to um, see how he's just, you know, it's like every time we're not sure what to do, he's got lots of great ideas and the, and the arts community has really, I think, stood up and helped out in this. It's been really great. So. Uh, thank you for that, Kelly. I do think that Matt has really connected uh, with the community, with the other arts organizations, and things are really starting to show a lot of fulfillment. And I do still continue to encourage council members to really kind of get in, even deeper in terms of what's going on in the arts, because it is starting to play a pretty big role in the reopening of town, and we'll play with the Social Equity Advisory Commission. Uh, you get a chance, uh, schedule some time with Matt, walk down Main Street with him with a cup of coffee, and and really get an appreciation for really what's going on. Thanks. He's very, very open and would love to have that opportunity. Uh, Kelly, do you have anything for child care? No, I think we covered it all earlier. Um, so tomorrow we have a resiliency committee meeting. I have a one o'clock same time with Polis. I'm on that electeds call where I'm gonna ask them why we don't have a mask ban and mask law in Colorado. Kelly, will you be on the resiliency call tomorrow? So you can, you can push some of our concerns forward as far as you know what happens if that we talked about tonight. Yeah, and definitely. I mean, we started a little bit last week, so that won't be a surprise for anyone. And you Shannon know. and Lucy will be able to help. Are you gonna be on that call with me, Rick? With Paul? Yes, I'm gonna be on the one o'clock with you. Okay. Make sure I don't say anything. Make wrong. sure you don't say any of the wrong thing. <laughs> Which you know I will. <laughs> Wild card. Uh, okay, we have uh, a couple of minutes. Anybody have any other matters they want to start with? So we don't have to do them tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how, kind of how, how Main Street's going with masks and stuff. You know, I, I can tell you that... Um, I think it's been very successful. I did send you guys some pictures of a place <laughs> uptown yeah. that I think we need to do some research on. But um, from just strictly from my being on Main Street Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I really feel like compliance went from 70% to 90% or more. And this is the first weekend that I did not have an argument with any customer about wearing a mask. Friday, Saturday night, and Sunday day. Everybody was wearing them. Nobody was wearing a t-shirt over their mouth. Nobody argued with me about it. It was, it was actually really nice. Maybe I just got lucky, but I feel like, you know, when we talked about having the corridor that goes to all the businesses, if you're wearing a mask there, you'll wear it into the business. It seems like it worked. Hey, Eric. Hey, Eric, are you? Kelly? I was just wondering if you knew of, or maybe Rick, um, of how the follow-up with the businesses who haven't been as compliant is going? Um, I don't have any follow-up for you on that. Okay. Hey, and, and Eric, I didn't get that email that you sent. Uh, was it a text or an email? It was, a, it was an email with, with a, a picture on it. I actually got 
it was on my Facebook. A guy sent me a Facebook note about a place in La Cima that had a full on, looked like a full on rager going on both outside and inside. Um, nobody wearing masks. I cannot vouch for the veracity of whether it was this weekend or if it was a year ago though. That's yeah, the, okay, I get you. I, I so, really, Eric, we got information already. The police have already, it, Okay. It was part of a, a memorial event, and they apologized for it, but they've been told they'll get a public health warning letter because it's, yep. that is not acceptable. So, um, Yeah, I mean, it's a shame you can't do that kind of stuff right now, but, you know, our fears about having a, about the town closing down again are real, and we really do need everybody to pull this one in the right direction. So, um, I agree, and, you know, we're not two weeks out of uh, Fourth of July yet, so it could get worse yeah. before it gets better. Yeah. Uh, question about masks, real quick: um, Have we added mask signage? The signage is great, and I agree the cl compliance is way better. Have we have we added signage to Ridge Street? I know there's there's signage like going into into Main Street down the hill, but um, is there signage along just walking down Ridge Street? I don't think there is yet, but PD was going to talk to Public Works today and figure out where they could and should add signage for Ridge. Okay, awesome. Thank you. There's so much stuff on the internet right now about people freaking out about wearing masks. It's unbelievable. And if we can stay relatively hassle-free, I know there's been a couple instances. I know that Taryn had an issue with the gentleman at Modus this weekend. There's been a couple things like that, but for the most part, I think so So far, so good with us, so. I agree, Eric. I think it's significantly better. Okay, it is seven o'clock. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's move on to our night meeting. I am going to call the night meeting for July 14th to order. It is 7 p.m. Uh, roll call, please, Helen. Mr. Gallagher. Here. Mr. Carlton. Here. Mr. Bergeron. Here. Ms. Owens. Here. Mr. Kuhn. Here. Ms. Giello. Here. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, approval of the minutes from uh, June 23rd. Anybody have anything they want to change? No? All right. Minute stand is presented. Agenda, Rick. Any changes? Uh, the only thing I want to point out is that we'll be working off of the agenda that was revised and, and reposted uh, yesterday afternoon, late afternoon. So it's the one where we added a uh, under new business planning matters, the decision on the Parkway Center mixed use development. Is it still, would it be on the, in Granicus, Rick? It was posted in Granicus, yes. Okay. Uh... Are we sure about that? We'll see it. Oh yeah, there it is. There it is. It's under planning matters, Jeffrey. Okay. okay. Um, excellent. Uh, okay, we're gonna have communications to council, and here's what I'd like to do. There, there's a Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna first go to Breckenridge Tourism Office update. While Lucy's talking, if you have a comment for the council. Use that Q&A function at the bottom, and then once Lucy is finished, um, we'll go to those if there is any, and if not, we will uh, continue on. So, Lucy? Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. Um, I've asked Brett to join us, and um, I wanted Brett to do a, a marketing update so you could see specifically how carefully we're going about um, very slow entry into market. Um, Brett, are you there? Yep, I'm here. See you. There yeah. you are. And um, and then I'll I'll circle back and wrap up after um, Brett does his overview. So go ahead, Brett. Thank you, Mayor Manuela, Town Council. Thanks for having me as always. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd just like to say thank you, Gary, for all of your time on Town Council and for your tutelage along the way. You're going to be missed. So thank you, Gary, personally. I appreciate it. Uh, marketing, Lucy kind of touched on a little bit here. So I just wanted to let you guys know if you kind of missed our last presentation. We have started um, our paid marketing up again. 
we did that just before the 4th of July holiday, but I just wanted to reassure you guys that, you know, it wasn't open the floodgates, you know, we're doing this very methodically. It's all strategically based off of the data we have available to us. So we took the community through all the data points uh, that we look at on a daily and weekly basis from the national level, um, all the way down to the state level, and then all the way down to the recognized level. So we have started that back up. Um, health obviously is our number one priority for the community. So we are using, I'm not sure if you guys have seen the uh, COVID map that um, you'll see the New York Times updated daily that John Hopkins did. So what we were able to do with that map, and we can't get it all the way down to the county level, but we are able to get it down to the city level. Um, in some instances, the county level where the cities are big enough, and we're using that map to fence areas that, we, that are spiking significantly and we are not marketing to those areas. So while we are out there um, with our drive strategy, I think you guys have heard us say that before, knowing people aren't flying, we are focusing on the kind of 400 to 500 mile radius around Colorado for people who will travel and using that map to fence certain areas. So we currently are not in Houston and Dallas and Phoenix, some of the big areas that are really spiking, but we are able to get into some of our key market. Um, just didn't seem it prudent to be in those areas where it's spiking. So just wanted to make sure you understood that we are out in market with all of our paid media and television again, um, and just doing it very, very cautiously and number one priority being the health of the community. Great, uh, um, any questions for Brett? Well, he's, okay. Then um, I'll just circle around with, uh, just to update you a little bit on PR, um, similar strategy for PR. We are not actively targeting masses of media to come and visit right now. It's not a great time to do FAMS or anything, but we are being very selective and able to pull in some A-listers. We're primarily looking for long lead. What we don't wanna do is do nothing, and then we have no press for next summer either. So we're doing some work now. Hopefully that will get media in 2021. We have, um, we had a nice piece in the Washington Post on fly fishing. They interviewed Tim from Breck Outfitters. He did a great job. Um, CNN did a nice piece on um, arts in the outdoors. Um, so Isaac made the hit parade again. Um, we are looking at a few other um, long leads that'll come in in August, the Austin Statesman, which is part of a fam that the Colorado Tourism Office is bringing, will be here and we will also likely have Forbes doing a travel story that would go in 2021. So again, very carefully, very deliberately, we're picking and choosing um, what and when we do market outreach. Um, and it, it, with all the journalists, they understand too, that the uh, the fam could be canceled like you know 24 hours out if something changed here in town so um we did um aaron to your i think it was aaron's question earlier um we did meet with launch and um are working on some creative mask messaging that will be used throughout town um including ridge um thanks for bringing that up and um, to add to something that Gary was talking about earlier with the solidarity um, art piece, um, the solidarity talk, as you all know, is gonna be here um, next Sunday. Um, the way that's gonna work is this very free form. Um, BCA has been very involved. Dennis Lucero has been very involved helping us with that. Um, they're gonna bring in a violinist. She'll start playing at two o'clock at Patty's bench and she'll play for a little bit, and then she will play and walk toward the stage um, in front of uh, the river walk. That's where the talk will happen. And just today, we were able to coordinate um, Latasha Dunstan, who's the art artist who's doing the art piece on the street for Solidarity, um, will be one of the keynote speakers in the Solidarity talk. So we were able to put those two things together. I think it'll be really nice. Um, we, right now, it looks, just looking at their Facebook page, uh, there's about 95 people that say they're coming with about another 15 that are interested. Um, again, we're not organizing anything, they're self-organizing, but certainly a few folks from the BTL and BCA will be there to help, um, you know, spread people out if we do need to do that. Um, we are ready to uh, do a survey uh, with the community. Rick um, had mentioned that Tess has done a lot of outreach with the business community and folks that she's been talking to are very pro um, walkable Maine and would like to see it extended, but we'll go ahead and put together a survey and quantify that data and be sure that we talk to people 
on Ridge and, and the, the folks that may not have uh, be doing, you know, have the benefit of Main Street, just so we have a very good balanced thing um, there for you all to work with. And then the last thing I would throw out is um, just in case you haven't already heard, Country Boy Mine is um, donating all of their revenue um, from any business this Thursday, 100% of all the revenue is going to FERC, which I thought was very cool. And you all would want to know about that. So, Thanks, um, Lucy. Sure, any questions for any of us? Lucy, do you have any sense how Breckenridge is doing compared to some of the other out of county resorts and you know similar, similar locales? I, I think we are um, holding our own. Um, you know, I look mainly like at Vail and Aspen, um, maybe Estes Park is a little bit different, you know, they, they're a little different crowd, they're a little different um, travel dynamic. Um, I, I think we are, we're holding our own. I mean, everybody's down a certain amount, but everybody seems to be able to get enough business going to keep, you know, to keep the businesses viable. And, you know, the big unknown is obviously what's going to happen in the fall. We're really concerned about what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere. And, you know, we're looking, we're working through the CTO and their international reps so that we can keep our thumb on the pulse of what's happening in South America, what's happening in Australia and ski communities in particular, um, just to see what learning, what benefit we may get from that. But um, in a nutshell, Jeffrey, I think we're holding our, we all wish it was better, but I think we're doing as well as you can expect without overshooting the mark. You know, Do you have a sense about the, the behavior of some of the other resorts? Are they as health conscious as we are here? I, I think so. I think for sure Aspen, for sure um, Eagle County, Glenwood. I, I, I would say in, in the Colorado set, I talk to those folks more frequently. I think they are. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you get out of state um, in some of uh, you know other des in, you know ski towns in other states, it might be a little bit different. Like okay, probably thanks. Jackson is not nearly as conservative as we are. Yeah. All right. Anything Lucy, else? Brad, I'd like to thank you guys for your prudent approach to the marketing. I, uh, you know, being able to fence around the the spiking areas is is good to hear. Yeah. Um, so I, I really appreciate the approach. Yeah, well, we want to stay, we want to keep everybody open, that's for sure. Well, thanks, Lucy, and thanks, Brad. Right. It's nice to see you, Brad. Yeah. Been a while. No, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Good to see you guys, too. <laughs> okay, so there are no Q&As that have come in. Shannon, any emails? All right, so uh, the public hearing is closed then for citizens' comments. We moved on to continued business. Um, we have a second reading of Council Bill number 25, Series 2020. This is an ordinance designating certain real property as a landmark under Chapter 11 of Title IX of the, town, Breck, of the Breckenridge Town Code, St. John's Church, 100 South French Street, Lots 1 and 2, Block 4, Abbott Edition. Tim? This ordinance, uh, if adopted tonight, would designate the St. John's Church as a landmark under the town's historic preservation ordinance. Council re will remember that several months ago, um, the town did a development agreement with the church. One of the benefits called commitments in the agreement that the town received in, uh, as part of the development agreement was the church's commitment and agreement to have the property landmarked under our ordinance. They have filed the required application. Uh, it has been re reviewed by staff and by the Planning Commission. Planning Commission um, has recommended that the property be landmarked. Staff has determined that the property meets the legal qualifications under the ordinance to be landmarked. And I think it's staff's recommendation that the ordinance be placed, uh, be approved on second reading. There are no changes to the ordinance from first reading. Thank you, Tim. Uh, any questions for staff? Any of the public, anyone in the public wish to comment on this application, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and you will have 30 seconds.
We should have Jeopardy music or something. <laughs> we should have Jeffrey sing. We should have Jeffrey sing. Oh, no jokes. Off color jokes. <laughs> no. no. Closed <laughs> is their emotion. I'm moving past on second reading Council Bill number 25, Series 2020, the title which has been read into the record. Second. There's a motion mm -hmm. and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. Cielo. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Gallagher. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. All right. Motion passes. Uh, we have uh, no first readings tonight. We do have two resolutions. First is resolution number 18, series 2020. It's a resolution making supplemental appropriations to the 2020 town budget. Brian? Brian, I can't hear you, Brian. I'm sorry, can you hear me? You, uh, dude. You one of the peanuts teachers? <laughs> you're, you're muted, dude. Sounds like you're underwater, Brian. Uh, I'll take it. Uh, Mayor <laughs> Council, this is a resolution that we need to pass that would address the reductions that we made in, in, in the uh, 2020 budget related to our, to the COVID crisis and our, you know, the reduction in spending. Um, you're all familiar with those, but we have to formally adopt those uh, changes so that we can then go in and basically uh, revise the budget to reflect those, uh, those new numbers and the re uh, revised numbers that were approved by the council. So, well, oh, that was very well articulated, Rick. I think I think we we scored having you do that. I could be I could almost be an accountant. Yeah, I think so. you're, you're as exciting as one. <laughs> uh, any questions for staff? No. Anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution? You have 30 seconds to type something into the Q&A. You know, I was thinking of what TV show I, this reminds me of, Hollywood Squares. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, you remember? Yeah, and I think I'm Paul Lynn. Center. <laughs> Jeffrey, I'm not old enough to remember that. Oh. <laughs> he overstayed his welcome, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did I hear somebody hit uh, Medicare today, buddy? What's that? Did I hear yeah, I did. That, uh, that, that somebody hit Medicare today? Oh, days a day. Wow. Happy birthday, bud. Yeah, congratulations. Happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing and we'll talk about your birthday at the next resolution a little bit more. Uh, is there a motion? I move we pass resolution number 18, series 2020, a resolution making supplemental appropriations to the 2020 town budget. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any additional discussion by the council? Roll call, please. Mr. Gallagher. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we have uh, resolution number 19, series 2020. Resolution approving an amendment to intergovernmental agreement regarding transfer of McCain property with Summit School District RE1. Mayor and Council, in June of 2019, you entered into the original uh, IGA with the Summit School District when you transferred real property located on the McCain from the town to the ownership of the school district. Um, as part of that agreement, we agreed to do two specific things by uh, December 31st of 2023. One was to, to raise the floodplain on that particular 10 acre site. And then the other one was to make sure that we had utilities installed in the roadway 
that runs adjacent to that site. And, you know, because of budget reductions, et cetera, we've worked with the school district and they are agreeable to extending those deadlines out three years to 2026. So I think this is helpful for us and I would, uh, you know, recommend that we approve this amended IGA. All right, thanks, Rick. Any questions for Rick? Anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution, please use the Q&A button bottom of your screen. You'll have 30 seconds to comment. Uh, happy birthday, Dennis. I think that's awesome mm -hmm. that you're here on your birthday night. Thank you, guys. It's a treat yeah. to be here. What else are you going to do at your age? I could think of a couple of things, but we won't get into that tonight. <laughs> and in COVID. Yeah. yeah. We are going to eat so much birthday cake. This is my entertainment. <laughs> That's a sad state of affairs. Right? <laughs> yeah, they're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? I move we pass resolution number 19, series 2020. A resolution approving an amendment to end a governmental agreement regarding the transfer of McCain property for the Summit School District RE1. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion by council? Roll call, please. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Gallagher. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Yellow. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. All right. Resolution passes. Uh, planning committee, planning commission decisions, any call-ups on the four approved? Nope. Planning commission decisions stand as presented. We have a decision concerning the Parkway Center mixed use building call-up hearing. Tim? Okay. At the conclusion of the call-up hearing at the last meeting, the council voted to conditionally approve um, the application and directed me to prepare a written decision. You have uh, before you uh, a proposed form of decision in this matter. It does conditionally approve the, the uh, application. Been the, app the decision document has been reviewed by staff. We believe it to be reflective of what the council approved orally at the last meeting. And, um, if the council agrees, there is a proposed form of motion in my memo. Tim, is it possible to vote against this one? Sure, as, it, as, long, as long as the majority right. approves the decision. Exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's up to you. Any uh, questions for Tim? But if, yeah. if we don't agree with it, we vote no, right? Like I know some of us. There's, I, I this, wanna... there's this funky thing that Tim and I have been talking about for years that the way that the code is written, it says if there's a passing a point analysis, the project must pass, which right. when you get to the situation, we know that it's going to pass potentially five to two. But Tim is always concerned because there is a passing point analysis on this that you and I disagree with. And it's not really the point analysis, it's the interpretation of the plat note that you and I don't agree with. It, it's, it's more of a technical thing, knowing that it's gonna pass because it passed last week, Tim's not as worried as when planning commissioners just go out on a limb at the end of a discussion and just say no without trying to change point analysis, so. That's correct. Hey, Tim, where would that motion be? Uh, Jeffrey, there there was a, a mem my memo, I believe, is in the agenda packet. Yeah, I'm looking at it. But... Jeffrey, with your permission, I'd be happy to do it. You up to it? Oh, let him do it. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Don't you'll let me down. You possibly my last opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before you do that, is there any other questions? Is there anyone in the public that wished to comment on this? final hearing for Parkway Center mixed use building. You have 30 seconds. So since we have 30 seconds, what does happen if say two people change their mind or something like that and vote no, Tim? What happens next? As long, Aaron, as long as the 
the uh, decision is approved, nothing happens. Nothing. I mean, this, 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 is the, this is the final decision of the council on the call up. If a majority of the, of the council were to vote no on this decision, then I would have to be instructed what to do. Okay, thank you. And Just we'd only need one to change because that was a 4-3 vote, as you recall. Yes, I do recall. Oh, that's right. It was a 4-3 vote. Whew. This is exciting government right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not there. All right. I'm going to close the public comment. And uh, is there a motion, please? Yes, Mayor. I move that with respect to application PL 2019-0292 involving the property located at 429 North Park Avenue, the town attorney's written decision on the application presented to the town council this evening be adopted as the town council's final decision on the application. Second. Wonderfully done, Gary. Really well done. Yeah, not bad. There is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion by council? No, roll call, please. Mr. Carlton. No. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Giello. No. Mr. Gallagher. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Mamula. No. All right, motion passes four to three. Tim, thank you very much. Yeah. Like there. <laughs> Guys, don't be doing that to Tim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, report of town manager and staff. Anything to add, Rick? Nothing. All right. Kind of boring. Um, we already went over our report of mayor and council members. Are there any other other matters this evening by the council? Okay. You're still going to do your other other matter, right? The phone service in this town. I would like to send a, I know we're having this discussion about small cells, which is a different issue, but is anybody else having cell phone problems lately? Yes. Is it, can yeah. we send a letter from the council, Rick or Shannon? Is that? I mean, we talked to Julia, we talked to Julia today, Julia, I mean, is it is everybody on Verizon that's experiencing the problems or are you, are you hearing it across the board? I'm Verizon. And I also feel like for some reason, it's like the Wellington area. Yes. It's, it's a really up Wellington road is really bad. I mean, as bad as it's ever been dropping calls. You were lucky if you could even make a call in the Wellington, uh, well, even up as Wellington well. towards square. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've heard a couple of people from the Whitehorn. So Julia was going to reach out to her contacts at uh, um, Verizon and uh, and ask them if, what's going on and what's changed recently to make it so bad. If they have any idea, and then make them aware of it. So, but this wouldn't make them rush in with their new technology, would it? Uh, no old technology. We're having problems. I know, but I don't want them to say, oh, you want small cells? We'll bring in small cells tomorrow. Well, <laughs> it's a little bit of a trade-off, right? So, yeah. I'll go back to a landline if that's trade-off. <laughs> that are 50-foot towers, give me a landline. All right, well, thanks for doing that, Rick. We'll see what, what comes of it. It sounds like, from the, from the Q&A uh, comments, it sounds like it's all over the place. So, um, all right. Anything else, gang? Well, thank you all. That was a long Zoom meeting and I uh, appreciate your concentration. A lot of important stuff. And uh, we will talk soon. Have a great night. Okay. Thank and you. Thanks, you uh, Take care. Good team. I brought her back, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs>